All right, folks, time to take your seats. As we begin, welcome to TLS Working Group at IETF 96. Um, let's see. You should probably all be familiar with uh, Note Well. Here's a, a brief summary of it. If you if you don't, you know, if this isn't familiar to you, it, it, it probably should be. Um, but... Uh, you can get more information at the links in the details section. All right. So uh, today, uh, today uh, Sean's not able to make it. Uh, so I'm going to be sole chair here. Um, so that'll be exciting. Uh, so we have Jabberscribe. Do we have note taker? You good? All right. And the blue sheets are going around. Okay, so for uh, agenda, we'll have a short uh, document status update. Then we'll spend most of our time on TLS uh, 1.3 topics uh, that, that this We'll take as much time as we'll need for, for that. Um, if there's time permitting, then we have a few additional uh, topics uh, to discuss. Um, uh, that, uh, and if you have it, if you're on the agenda for additional topics and you haven't sent slides to the chairs, uh, please do so so we can get them uploaded. So, any. Uh, Questions or additions? Okay, so since uh, last IETF, we've had uh, one RFC published to the Cha Cha Poly 1305 uh, Cypher Suites. Um, we have a couple documents in Auth 48. Um, cached Info has uh, been uh, has had all approvals received, so that should be leaving Auth 48 momentarily which is pretty exciting because that document's been around for a really long time. Um, False Start is waiting on FFDHE, and we're still waiting on DKG for the last questions, to answer last questions in the Auth48 period. So, awesome. That would be great. Um, then we have a couple... Uh, uh, documents that we've adopted, uh, the ECDHE PSK suites, um, and a Dane document for DNSSEC, Dane record and DNSSEC authentication chain extension. Um, so what's the main topics? Obviously, uh, TLS 1.3 and our update to uh, the ECC docs for TLS 1.2. Um, and since the working group did not want to pursue the secure password draft, that's been set free so it can pursue independently, so it can be pursued independently of the working group. Um, and there's been some discussion of LTS, but we haven't seen a lot of uh, desire to pick that up as a work item at this point. I think right now we're very focused on 1.3 and hopefully we'll get that out soon. Okay, so I think now we'll go to, uh, did you have a question of your own or something to add? Uh, 
I, I just uh, forgot about the 4492 BIS. Um, we have a new version of that came out a couple of weeks ago, and um, uh, I don't know uh, if it's ready for la for working with last call or not. But um, otherwise, we, sh we really should decide if we want to have all the EDDSA there and wait for the document that document to clear CFRG, or if we want to just um, publish it as it is. Are there any CFRG folks in the room? So I guess, I guess the question is, is e, how far along is the EDDSA document? Is that momentarily or is that still being worked on? Uh, Kenny Patterson, uh, CFRG co-chair. I think we're getting pretty close now. I think there's a couple of nits being found. Um, there was some implementation recently and uh, a couple of questions came up about details in the spec, but we're pretty much there. Okay. So I think we'll, we'll have to maybe wait and see a bit, but it might be worth waiting so we don't have to do it again. All right, so Ecker. That's, you got that. And there's, a, there's the pink box. Keep me on the side, okay. Um, right. Okay, then. Um, so we're now in draft 14. Um, I'm hoping that we, hoping we don't hit 20. There was, there was some desire to stop at 13, but we just couldn't quite, quite pull it off. Um, so um, this has actually been two drafts since uh, last ITF. Um, so here is a summary of, of, the, of the significant changes. Um, everything that asked for something I'm actually gonna hit, I got a slide on later, I think. Um, so the big set of changes is that at the last ITF, we agreed to remove all the Diffie-Hellman um, uh, zero round trip modes, um, both the ones that were, uh, were Diffie-Hellman with um, no client auth and the ones that had client auth and rely solely on the sort of pre-SK resumption for zero round trip. So, um, this draft um, executes, well, 13 executed all of those changes. Um, um, and we've verified they're like reasonably complete in the sense that we actually have 13 implementations that, that interrupt. So, um, you know, there, there's still open questions, but, uh, but that, at least quasi works. Um, the other big change is um, that we restructured the key schedule, to, um, it, which had gotten messy and had some um, now out of date assumptions about the order in which keys were known. And it turns out that like keys are known in a very specific order. And so you can have a linear key schedule um, and that makes things cleaner. Um, the final big technical change um, was a request by um, Karthik Bhargavan and some other people to um, add sort of a, we're calling a resumption context to the key derivation. Um, and the, the intention here is to sort of carry the um, session context through resumption into, into future connections, um, which I can get to, I'll get to a little bit. Um, then um, we finally finished baking hello retry request, um, added these uh, ticket flags for a new session ticket, um, and a bunch of other sort of uh, stuff you can just read in the screen, which I'm not gonna bother to go through because it's just too boring and you could read the draft. Um, the, um, the only thing that I wanted to call out that uh, um, is a significant change here that I guess um, nobody expected on the list, so I just did it, is um, traditionally TLS load handling is kind of a mess in the sense that, um, uh, that there are like warning alerts and there are fatal alerts. And in principle, you're supposed to continue after a warning alert, but as a practical matter, implementations typically just choke if you send them a warning alert. And so, and so, um, and also many implementations don't actually send the right alert to the right times. Um, so basically what I did was I removed the support for alerts that are warning, or warning level alerts that don't mean I'm closing the connection now. So um, now all the warning level alerts mean I'm closing the connection. All the alerts mean I'm closing the connection now. And warning level alerts mean I'm closing the connection and you can just tell the application that things were fine. And fatal level alerts mean I'm closing the connection and you should tell the application there's some kind of error. Um, it also used to be the case that TLS um, at various levels of force told you that if you received a fatal alert, you're not supposed to resume the connection. Um, 
that basically is not consistent at all with a session ticket style implementation of, TL, of the TLS server. Um, and so I softened that substantially. So that basically it says, if you're keeping state, like you're a client or you have a session cache, then you should probably not read the connection. Um, but if you're, a, if you're a ticket implementation, you can do whatever you want. Um, we can soften that even further um, and remove the requirement entirely. There's, to the best of my knowledge, no technical reason for refusing to, uh, for, for refusing to resume after a fatal alert. Um, it's, I think, it's a, basically it's an abundance of caution, but um, it's also not a particularly difficult practice. Um, one thing I forgot to put on my slides, so maybe we'll just, you could just note that we hit this in the agenda. Um, there was some debate about um, how, uh, how forcefully we should require people to send alerts or not send alerts, and David Benjamin and David Garrett had some discussion on a list of that. Um, so uh, we had a discussion in an interval a while back about how to handle this, but I never executed it. So I just want to make sure people are still okay with the proposed execution. Um, finally, at the end, um, I completely rewrote the security analysis section, which had been which had been sort of baking, which had been sort of sitting around since SSL version three and no longer reflected how the protocol actually worked. Um, so the target of this section is to give you a uh, largely informal view of what the properties the protocol is supposed to provide and then provide citations to more formal definitions of what the protocol actually does as well as uh, citations to the known references of analysis that shows the protocol does or not, does not do the things that it is claims to do. Uh, it would be great if people would read that and send me comments, um, especially people from CFRG. I'm looking at Kenny here, um, was already sent me some talk, talk to me verbally. Um, so this is not intended to be like a scientific proof, but it's intended to give you enough pointers to references that you can understand what's going on. Um, so I think I'm, I don't think that the, for, <coughs> the handshake part, I'm not sure. Uh, I have a fair level of confidence about because that's the part I understand the literature better. The symmetric part I'm less confident about. So I'm hoping we can get that cleaned up. Um, okay. Next slide, please. Uh, just, just one question. I wanted to see if there's anybody any concern in the room about any of the alert changes, since I don't think we talk about that any later. Just give people opportunity if they want to come to the mic now. Okay. Thanks. So I guess I might as well, I might as well at this point summarize what I'm going to do in the future, which is um, we'd agreed back in the interim in Seattle that the rule would be that um, the rule would be that there are many conditions where uh, that we told you had to fail the handshake, and that it used to say you must send an alert, and there was a lot, a lot, a lot of sense that we should instead say is you must terminate the handshake, and if you send an alert, it better be this one, but not to require you to send the actual alert. Um, I don't actually feel strong at this, but this is what we agreed, so I'm planning to execute it unless somebody objects to that. Okay. Um, so as I say, the, the the sort of major two major structural changes are. Um, really nailing that are removing all the DV Helm based on um, zero round trip stuff and nailing it to the resumption PSK and the key schedule. So those go together. The um, we bounced around a little bit about what goes in this first flight, but what goes in this first flight now is um, the early data indicator saying that you wanted you would intend to send zero round trip data, a key share, uh, sorry, a pre-shared key, which indicates the key you're actually going to use to encrypt this, the, the um, zero trip data. Um, the convention here is that the first one, if you send a list, because you might have multiples, the first one is the one you use to encrypt the zero trip data. Um, and then a um, Diffie Hellman key share, which you, I suppose, don't literally have to send, but you really are going to be very sad if you don't send, because first of all, you may be doing PSK DHE as the key exchange, in which case you need it. Um, and also, the server is at any time permitted to forget all its tickets and simply force you back into full handshake, and that means you would need a Diffie Hellman share. So you'd be kind of silly enough to send that, though I suppose it's in some sense optional. Um, the um, I forgot to show it here, but you also send this ticket age extension, which was um, pr um, given to us by Martin Thompson and Cal Neckritz, which basically indicates um, the time between the ticket was delivered to you and the current time. And the point of this is basically tightly bound the window of, of replay of these messages. So the, the structure here is basically that the server stores the time that he sent the ticket in the ticket. And then when he and when the ticket comes back in, he pulls that time out, looks at the delta, the, the actual delta versus the claim delta. And if those are off by more than whatever slack he has, he rejects the zero on the, 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 um, he, reje he rejects the um, the zero t zero t data. Um, this doesn't give you complete protection because you still have these sort of fragmentation attack that DKG identified back in Seattle, but it gives you protection against se sending the same thing over and over again um, and having it constantly processed. Um, 
if the if the client is not active. So the concern Kyle had raised was that you could just basically send zero RTT data even if the client wasn't even on the net and and it was already processed. And so this prevents that largely. Um, then you follow up by the by a finish message. Um, very important to note: you don't need to read this finish message in order to determine whether you're going to do zero RT. Um, so you so everything you need to know about whether you're going to accept zero RT is in the client hello. The finish message just confirms, just provides an integrity check over that, and I'll get to that more in a, in a, in a minute. Um, so the, for, this is important from an implementation perspective because it means that you can make all the important decisions about what you're going to do purely by reading the client hello and send the server hello right away, and then basically convert to reading the finish in the first flight rather than having to bounce back and forth between reading and writing. Um, so if what you do is you read the client hello, you make all your you make all your negotiation decisions, including whether you're going to accept the zero on trip data, and then when you read the finished, if the finished doesn't verify, you support the connection because it's basically just toast. Um, so this makes the implementation a lot easier. This is a change between 13 and 14. In 13, we had this ticket age in encrypted extensions between these two points, and it made the implementation quite a bit harder. Um, then you send the app, then then we go back to what we had before. You send the application data, if any. Um, the why you would offer zero trip data and not send application data, I have no idea. Um, and then you send the end of early data indicating it's over. Um, I think I mentioned this in the draft, but I'll mention it publicly now for people who uh, um, who are maybe thinking of implementing. Um, when you build when you build your stack, it's like super important that you don't wait for the, the end of early data before you send the server hello. And the reason is because you want the client to be able to keep sending data in this first flight until he's received the server hello. So you never have a deadlock condition of dead air on the network while each side's waiting for something. Um, however, if you write your implementation, so you wait for the end of early data, so it's fine to wait for the finished, and you should wait for the finished. But um, um, but um, if you uh, if you wait for the end of early data, um, then you're going to have a deadlock because the clients which won't send end of early data until you receive server hello. So that's like um, if you find yourself deadlocking when you're doing zero trip, that's probably what's happening. Um, okay, so this is mostly review. Um, next slide. Um, the other big change is, as I said, we rationalized the key schedule. Um, so the key schedule had sort of these weird ins and outs and loops and stuff because we we're trying to handle the cases where sometimes you'd like know like one secret first and says, you know, there's another secret first, but then Karthik and Antoine pointed out that like, and Cedric that actually it was the case that you knew the secrets in a very specific order and you could always assume that. And so, um, the we research the key schedule pretty substantially, make it a lot simpler to work in. Um, the basic idiom is that the everything on the left side is pure entropy. So everything on the left side of the schedule, basically, you you start with like you know you got to start with some initial value. There's basically a current secret, and every time you get a new piece of um, secret key material, you just mix it in with HKDF extract, and um, the um, so at the very top you start with a PSK if there is one, otherwise you have a zero. Um, and you mix it in, you get this early secret. And then if you have a Tiffy Hellman share, you mix that in, otherwise you mix it to zero. Um, and this last this last section, we have a pointer, don't we? Yeah, there we go. Um, but I have to stop gesturing that way, gesture a different way. Um, so this last stage here um, is strictly speaking unnecessary, but what it's doing is it's separating the keys from the it's separating the keys that are the handshake secret keys from the master secret, so that basically you can't backtrack between them if you somehow have a compromise here, um, you can't backtrack back to the finished secret. It's not really clear if this is providing substantial security value, there's some contrived attacks that this kind of protects. Um, if like you get compromised halfway through the handshake. Um, like I say, it's contrived, but it's not um, It's not a big deal. The other thing this does, um, which is actually more interesting, is if you ever had a key exchange um, where the there was a final key, which was known only after the handshake was partly complete, um, you could mix it in here. So if you were doing a, if you had, for instance, um, static diffie Hellman certificates and you wanted to mix in the diffie Hellman key at the very end, you could shove it in here. So that, that was the clinching argument for why I left this placeholder in here. It's also just one more crank of HKDF. Um, so as I say, this is all just entropy on the left side. Um, then um, the right side basically is you take these these base secrets and you and you basically mix in the transcript at any given time to produce to produce sort of I wouldn't call them working secrets. What they are is they're secrets that use, used to make working secrets. Um, so the convention here is anything which is like used as input key material is called a secret. Anything which is like used to actually like do HMAC or AAD is called a key. Um, uh, at least that's what I'm trying to do that I may have failed. Um, so the idea here is that um, to take this example, say you 
take the handshake secret, you mix in the, mix in the client server hello with a log with some label, and this gives you the handshake traffic secret, and you use that to generate the keys that are actually used inside for the handshake messages, because obviously you need like, um, you need, you know, an AED key in each direction, not in each direction. So you only have to mix in the log once, and then all the key derivations basically don't take any context at all. They just basically take the, because they already have the context pre-mixed in. So that turns out, as I said, to make the implementations easier because you can, um, you can have a single, uh, a single input to the key derivation functions. It doesn't have to include the logs. Um, uh, it was easier for me, at least. I think it was easier for other people too. So um, let's see, that's pretty much it on that one. Next slide. Um, so uh, the final sort of key scheduling thing that, that went in here was um, Karthik Bhargavan had pointed out that the uh, the handshake trans it, when you do resumption, the handshake transcript of the first handshake, which is what includes the server identity, isn't always tightly bound into the subsequent handshakes. And so this is the uh, this is the so the, this this particular um, lack of context is is one of the sources of the. Uh, uh, of, the, of the issue that um, that Scott and um, and Vandermoy and uh, um, Kremers et cetera found um, in the sort of initial drafts of post handshake authentication um, about <clears throat> about what was being signed. Um, so um, while that while, while that attack doesn't happen um, if you don't um, unless you add features you don't already have uh, or we didn't already have, um, Karthik suggested it would be easier if you just added this content all the time and then you and then you, and then you'd be much safer about what about what you could do with the log. Um, so the basic hack we did was take the, um, take the resumption master secret and compute two values out of that. One is, a one is, um, one is the PSK that you use for the next connection. Another is a context value, which you feed into the transcript logs. Um, and so basically anytime you do start the handshake hashes, you take both these values. And if you're not resuming this value, it's just, a, just hashed off a zero. Um, David Benjamin asked, why are we hashing the second thing? Um, I don't have a good reason for that. It was uh, it was an aesthetic, perhaps mischoice. Um, I don't uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because I have a we have a discussion later about um, whether we should change this in some way. So um, uh, maybe I'll just hold on to that. But um, this is not clear. Um, next slide. Um, I think we can skip this. Um, okay, so this is on the agenda as a real thing, but I think it, it, we actually got consensus that we had a it's really extended discussion at the last IETF and then at this at this Tron two post workshop about um, key separation for the messages that are sent after the after the handshake is complete, namely the application data messages versus the key update and any post handshake client authentication and the new session ticket, and so. It looked like for a while we were going to have some very unpleasant choices about um, security provability uh, versus um, uh, versus implementation complexity versus analyzability from other perspectives, um, because the security proofs worked. The cryptographic security proofs worked a lot better if you had uh, basically a separate key that you used to encrypt say, the new session ticket versus the application data. Um, but it made the implementations like really unpleasant, and we didn't have a really good way of, of marshalling it. Um, and so we have this extended discussion on the list, and then Hugo Krochik produced some nice results that basically seemed to show that this key separation was was very valuable in the handshake phase, but wasn't as valuable afterwards, and you get away without it. Um, and so I think there was a uh, general consensus we could live, which is the existing design, which is to have one key at the very end. Um, uh, Hugo seemed okay with it. Doug Stibble seemed okay, seemed grudgingly okay with it. Uh, um, so, and I know that the um, people doing the symbolic analysis. Um, prefer it this way. So um, I, I think we had rough consensus to move this way. Um, very important, there'll still be key separation for the ordinary handshake messages for the, versus the ordinary application name messages. So the handshake messages are still encrypted with one key and the application messages are encrypted with another. It's merely the post handshake handshake messages which are not which are encrypted with the same key. Um, yeah, it, so that's my impression too is that the there is consensus on the list for at least rough consensus for this approach, but we should have some discussion now if people are not comfortable with this. Yeah, so Martin Thompson, this this is great um, because the complexity of the alternatives was horrible and some of the privacy properties were also kind of sh shocking. You didn't mention that. Oh, sorry. Um, but th this, this is specifically key update, new session ticket, and the post handshake auth for people who weren't following along. Right. 
New session ticket was the one that bothered me the most, but it seems like Hugo's happy, so I'm happy if Hugo's happy. So is there anybody who feels this needs additional discussion? All right. Okay, here we go. Okay, so first open issue, and I, I, I'm going to apologize in advance for like the fact that this showed up on the list so late. Um, as we started to implement, we started to find that the cipher suite negotiation had become um, crufty, maybe the right word here. Um, as everybody knows, TLS, um, when, T when SSLV3 rolled out, um, there was exactly one control point for cipher suite negotiation, namely the cipher suite, and that indicated everything important about the connection. Um, Unfortunately, it turns out there a there are parameters which you wish that have been able to indicate that didn't indicate. Like for instance, which um, signature algorithms the uh, you know you be you, you be you be cromulent with um, in terms of hash function. Um, hence one point two um, and b um, other, or things like the curve types you supported um, and um, b it started to lead to shall we say a proliferation of code points. Um, at, so it was already kind of hairy. Um, if you go and look at a one-two implementation, um, you like, uh, you know, you pick the cipher suite, which tells you ostensibly which like which signing algorithms you should be using, and then you look at signature algorithms, which tells you ostensibly which signing algorithms the other side would support, and somehow you have to pick a key which conforms to both of those. Um, so that was already kind of aversive. Um, the um, uh, name the name group stuff made it worse for the same reason because it was possible, like for instance, advertise elliptic curve to Hellman and then say I don't support elliptic curve to Hellman groups. Or um, um, and similarly, even though um, and now in one point three where we have the finite field groups and the um, Diffie Hellman and the EC groups in the same space, but it's possible to say it's possible to like say I support Diffie Hellman I support finite field Diffie Hellman, but then offer only elliptic curve to Hellman groups or vice versa. Um, so um, it was sort of clunky, cl clunky and orthogonal. And um, also, also you could only offer key shares in one group. Um, and in 1.3, this gets worse, as I say, because of, uh, also the P-share key. So it was, it was kind of nasty. Um, and when it started to implement, it started to get very painful. Um, and so I sort of like resisted any change here for a really long time because I was like, we have something and it kind of works and it's going to be a big change, change our implementations. But finally, David Benjamin prevailed upon me to look at this and, and Nick Sullivan. And so at least, we, and so a bunch of us, um, me and David and Nick and Smode and um, Filippo and Martin Thompson and, and Richard Barnes, I sat down and took a look at this and, and have a proposal for how to clean this up in a way that we think makes life better. Um, there have also been some ominous grumbling, by the way, from other people about how much this sucked in specific Alari. Um, so um, I have a proposal here, which I apologize again for the lateness, is I think a substantial simplification, which I think we should look at adopting. Um, so the basic idea is that um, to it, rather than bundling everything up into a big cipher suite, to independently negotiate the things you already are quasi-independently quasi negotiating anyway. Um, so you basically have four orthogonal axes. You have the AED and the PRF, which we're going to just in order to keep our sanity tied together. Um, so th that means we'd have a present, we'd have three separate AED PRF code points. We'd have AESGCM 128 and SHA 256. We'd have Cha Cha Poly SHA 256. Um, and then we'd have AES 256 um, uh, SHA 384. Um, the signature algorithms, namely the things that you would allow the um, uh, um, you know, the things that others I could sign with, um, which um, now n n it post the change David Benjamin suggested about signature scheme also includes the group, the, the elliptic curve groups we accept signatures in. So there's no way, so you don't have to worry about the interplay between name groups and ECDSA anymore. Um, so we already made that change. Um, and then the key shared and supported group, key shares and supported groups, which indicates which, um, which Diffie Hellman modes you'd support. And this, of course, merges elliptic curve Diffie Hellman and finite field Diffie Hellman into the same box. You just treat them as Diffie Hellman with different different group sizes. Um, and then the PSK itself. Um, so breaking these up into four axes and negotiating them as separately as you possibly can, um, which is fairly separately but not completely separately. Um, this is actually incredibly straightforward for the, all the public key modes. And if we didn't have PSK, this would be like incredibly straightforward. Um, PSK makes it somewhat more complicated, but it's not as complicated as you'd think. Um, and I think certainly less complicated than it was than it was when you had everything in one box. Yes, Martin. Yeah, Martin Thompson. Um, one thing that 
you should point out about the key shares name group things is if at some point we want to do this post quantum stuff, I know that that's happening in, in Chrome, we would define the, a new group in inverted commas that contained ECDHE um, parameters and whatever post quantum parameters were necessary so that you would combine the two key exchanges and it just looks like a single group. Yeah, that, that seems like the most attractive design for that. Yeah. So you have like, you know, New Hope plus 25519 as a single key share. Right. So good. I suppose. Um, so one thing I realized is uh, what thing we lose by splitting it up. I just realized this, but lose by splitting it up is uh, the prioritization of like which one is more important. So the cipher suites give us like this order of like this. Um, this kind of is uh, like the GCM, and then like mm -hmm. SHA-56 is more important than this. So which one do we ratchet first? Uh, um, uh, do you have thoughts on that? I, I don't think we do lose that. Um, what we lose is the ability to talk about combinations in the same way. So, um, so you, so each of these actually does try to prioritize list with this, with the exception of PSK. Um, so you can say I like this name group more than this name group or this name group, and you can say I like this initial algorithm more than this initial algorithm. What you can't say is, well, what I mean, so what you can't say is I would like, you know, curve two five five one nine, but only with. AESGCM and don't give me crypto five value with cha cha. Um, and you can't, I mean, so A, you can't say it, and B, you can't prioritize it, right? Um, so, um, that, so, so 1.2 allowed you to do that, and there are some edge cases where people did that. So, probably the most, the, the, the is Russ Housley in the room? Um, Forteza is an example of a case where you did that because you could only use Forteza with Skipjack and KEA, uh, uh, you know, with Skipjack, KEA, and, and DSA. Um, and Sweet B is kind of an example of that, but the Sweet B's every suites are kind of a mess anyway. Um, so, um, so in general, um, like the, the, the thing you lose isn't the ability to prioritize, it's the ability to express that you don't, that you only express, only set sparse points in the space. Um, and that's the, and that's the usual counter argument against, against these Chinese menu, um, you know, negotiation schemes is you only can express the full space. Um, now that we've reduced the options so much, it's actually really hard to understand what the situation would be when you did when you didn't have a, a, a full um when you couldn't negotiate the full space um and so the i mean basically the, the, the situation of course would be the client wouldn't support some combination and the way you deal with that if you're the client is you merely do not offer you just you just can't offer the fully orthogonal space you have to pick whatever horizontal works yeah so so martin thompson i know i know that we used to do this but we used to have logic to select the group based on the symmetric cipher that was in play and we would sort of set a minimum bar and we'd look at the certificate and what key was in the certificate and all that bunch of other things. I know when Eka showed me his implementation of this change, um, he removed all of that, it simplifies everything a, a great deal. But you can still do that. You can st still decide that if you've chosen AES GCM 256, that 25519 is not acceptable and you'd only support ED448 right. or P384 in, in combination with that. That's a choice that the server can make. The client really doesn't have, have a lot of control that, over that. That's correct. That's exactly the impact. Um, so next slide. So if you just consider the um, the public key side, this is like incredibly straightforward. Um, the cipher suite just indicates the AED and PRF. Um, we initially toyed with the notion of um, basically keeping all the existing cipher suites um, and um, basically saying that if you offer anything with AESGCM, that means you accept everything with AESGCM. Uh, that turned out not to, when I actually tried to, tried to write that down and implement that, did not work well. Um, so um, probably it's actually better to simply define three new cipher suites, only to find those P, the PRFs and just pun on that. Um, it's a little hairy, but it'll work fine. Um, uh, so a m minor cleverly named um, TLS underscore star underscore with <laughs> underscore uh, um, AESGCM 128 uh, SHA. Um, um, we, can, we can pick out the names. Um, this is the added bonus, um, which I wasn't sure I should uh, disclose here, of allowing us to prune um, some of the um, cipher switch which you might or may not like so much. Um, which somehow crept into our list because they 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 still passed the um, AAD bar even though they had symmetric ciphers which we didn't actually love. Um, the Camellia, I'm looking at you. Um, so um, so so since we have to define new cipher suites, this gives us the advantage of like only picking the ones we really like. So that's kind of nice. Um, the signature algorithm is uniquely determines the server cert and the signature scheme. And what I mean here is that the um, is that the server simply said the client simply says I support these signature algorithms, and this and the server can supply any cert that that conforms to those. Um, 
the um, the key shares in the supporter groups together determine the key exchange. So the client in the supporter group says, I would support these groups. And, and then the key shares he has, these are the, these are the shares are actually given you. And the um, and then the server picks something out of that list or hello retire requests on him. It's been pointed out to me in privately that you could actually merge these by having, um, by having instead of having supported groups list, having um, offering key shares that were no key shares, basically they're empty. Um, I personally think that's less elegant, but like the, 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 those are those are equivalent data structures. So um, I'm not going to that. Um, and the server's key share obviously tells you which group he picked. So you don't need to reference back to this. Right now, you have to reference back to the Cypher suite and look to see which, and look to see. So right now, it's possible, for instance, to say for the client to offer FF2048 and 25519 and offer an ECDHE and DHE Cypher suite and the server to respond with a DHE Cypher suite, but an elliptic curve share. And the client's supposed to check that. Um, and um, I don't I don't know if the clients actually do, um, but the clients are supposed to. Um, and so obviously this makes that impossible because basically whatever the, the share the server gives you um, is what he did, what he wanted. And so all you have to do is validate the server sent you a share, and the um, and that's a much easier check to make of the system. Um, so is this all? So I guess maybe do people want to talk about this, um, or do you want or do you want to see what you have to do to make PSK work um, before we talk about this? Because if you hate this already, then you're going to hate the other part. So we can you can just skip past we can skip past that discussion, right? Um, um, Hanno Beck, uh, what's not answered for me is the hash function for the signature algorithm. It's like, in, that's in signature. Oh, see, that's in signature schemes. So, so you have like a set of RSA PSS with SHA five hundred. Correct. And that's that that's all, that change was made about a month ago, courtesy David Benjamin. This is DKG. Uh, so. Uh, I don't think that we need to solve this now, but I know that we have talked in the past about uh, offering uh, signatureless uh, static Diffie-Hellman yes. mix-ins. So would that mean that we would define a new signature algorithm that's no signature, just static Diffie-Hellman, or would that somehow get mixed into the key? Because those then yeah. end up collapsing, right? I, I, um, right. I think you. I think you. I think you would call that. I think you would call that. You know, static Diffie-Hellman signatures. Yeah. Okay, but. But now there is a coupling. If you if we do that, I'm just pointing out that there is a coupling between. So if I offer three signature schemes, and yes, so I think it you're, becomes yeah. a little bit less orthogonal. If we, yeah, I agree. If you want to consider that. Yeah, I agree. Well, Antoine Dernia here from MSR. Uh, just to point out that to expand on these comments. Uh, what you are losing here by doing that, I'm, I'm actually in favor of the change, but just pointed out that you actually lose some protocol modularity by doing that, in the sense that uh, many previous CLS versions were using non Diffie-Hellman or PSK based uh, key exchanges that you have no no longer any way of uh, specifying as an extension. I think. So, so you mean uh, like SRP, for instance, exactly, right? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So I guess my. My, my general sense about those things is that it was a kind of a mistake to try to wire them into TLS, and that they weren't very good fits, and that um, you know that, 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 that I mean we haven't really made any attempt to accommodate SRP or JPEG or anything in TLS 1.3. Um, I haven't even looked at how they fit them in, so I'm not sure they can fit into the current structure in any case. So I think I, I, I guess I guess what I'm optimizing for at the moment is is ease of implementation and ease of design for. I think the main run of cases, and I think this is a case that's worth sacrificing. Um, if someone feels differently, I'm certainly happy to hear about it. Uh, Sean Turner wants to know if we're still adding the IETF recommended and no comment columns in the registry. Um, uh, we would still uh, no. Well, so for Cypher suites, we would no longer for Cypher suites. We still have to, but we we probably define a new. Um, I think we. I think we. I think the way we would deal with that would be. That we can have a separate draft which assigned all the existing cipher suites. I have recommended no comment, and then this would only have to assign the new ones. We the new ones we generated, and and we'd have to have and we already have to have those. We already had those groups as interest schemes anyway, so or needed them. So Martin Thompson, in terms of the um, Pikes and and SRPs and the, and the like, I think if any if someone wants to try to fit those into TLS one three, that's a separate exercise and. That may be un unpleasant for those people, but I think that we're kind of making the right decision in terms of the trade-off here. I mean, there's always basically involved having some cipher sheet indicator that was like, I'm going to do a bunch of weird shit in the rest of this handshake anyway. Uh, David, 
Benjamin Google. Uh, one quick uh, thing to add to that is that we still have the extensions field. So if we need, if we want to like add special Snowflake auth, we could add a special Snowflake extension where you offer the parameters for your special Snowflake auth, and then if the server decides to act it, then like that munches into the key schedule in some yeah. interesting way. Um, probably would need to think about how well that actually works, but I think we probably still have an in. Russ Housley. So Eric, I think you said that the second bullet carries the hash algorithm used for the signature, but the first bullet carries the hash that's being used in the PRF. Those are already distinct. And so if you, it's possible to put several choices in the front, several choices in the back, right? Uh, that then lets you end up picking very different hash functions for the two. So we, so in fact, so in fact, um, that's, that, that's either a feature or a misfeature of TLS 1.3 as opposed to TLS 1.2. Um, so um, it's quite common. Um, so 1.3 stacks absolutely support, for instance, um, SHA-384 signatures with AES-128, with AES um, SHA-256 SHA uh, PRF. And in fact, that we ran that bug in interop testing where um, where I can either where boring SSL tried to do that and an SS wouldn't take it. So um, that's an intentional feature of, of, of 1.3. I think that this gets back to Martin's point of the server is an option not doing that. The client doesn't have an option of saying he doesn't want it, other than only offering one le one length. So so if the server picks a choice that the client can't live with, it can only hang up and has no way to negotiate one that will work. Right. The, the, way, the, way, the, way the, the way that the client, the way, what the client has to do if the client wants that is the client has to only offer a consistent profile that is fully orthogonal. So, I mean, if you think about it, like, you know, you should be offering sweep B level one or sweep B level two, but not sweep B level one and two. Those aren't, those aren't coherent. Um, yes, I have another comment. Um, why not go all the way with uh, this design change? Uh, and by that, I mean, why, why still negotiate the PRF in the Cypher suite? Because if you look at, historically, the, the, the hash function that appears in Cypher suite name, it was actually used for uh, the re record level macking. Yes. And uh, this has been kind of piggybacked to be PRF but in TLS 1.2, but um, if uh, you actually want to say that Cypher suite corresponds to the record algorithm, then why not negotiate the PRF uh, like says so signatures and I mean you certainly could it's just one more thing we have to deal with and it didn't seem like it added a lot of value um, I mean I think that would be that would be something which we could which we consider if we thought we wanted to go this general road okay any any other comments on this if not uh, maybe we should just get a sense of the room as to uh yeah I mean I mean I think yeah, yeah. I mean yeah, if people think this is horrible then I don't want I won't talk about PSK <laughs> Your Honor, I think this is an improvement, but if you're forcing some clients to to send multiple uh, proposals one after the other, like the sweet A, sweet B thing, maybe you should allow them to say somehow, this is my proposal, but I have some other proposals in store, so that you don't have an actual fallback situation with everything that entails. Mm. It seems that there there is some risk that this introduces a fallback scenario. So I mean, so it's already the case that I mean, it's already kind of the case that you can say incoherent things. Um, um, so I mean, so so in, in particular, it's already the case that you can say the most obvious incoherent thing you can say um, is, I would like a cipher suite that has a base PRF hash that is different from the hash that you're signing with, um, um, or I would like a cipher suite that has I would like a cipher suite that has sort of a nominal security strength of X, but I only support group. Uh, I only support keys with like an insanely different security strength. So, give me an example. I can say I support AES one twenty eight two fifty six, but I only support P five twenty one. Um, I could absolutely. So I mean, it's already possible. You can say things that are that are um, th that are incoherent and nonsensible. Um, I, I don't, I'm not sure this actually makes the problem that much worse. Um, the, I mean, largely, the, largely the thing you used to be able to say that you can't say now. We want to do this is. Um, is you used to be able to say, for instance, I, I would like all of to, is to say, I, I, I'd support, you know, all finite field math and all, and all of the curve math, but I won't support, um, you know, I won't support use of finite field key exchange with all the curve signatures and not, you wouldn't be able to say that. But 
Um, it's already the case that because you're orthogonally negotiating the groups and the, the groups for, for the signatures and the key share, that you can say things that are largely or really inconsistent about, about security levels. It's really the really thing. The thing that's really different. The thing that's really changing here is is the ability to sort of mix and match between NIST and non NIST and um, and finite field and elliptic curve. Uh, this is DKG. I, I, I'm generally supportive of this change as well. I just want to think a little bit more clearly uh, about how it relates to the version. So. We have these new star cipher suites. Yes. Do we expect those to be meaningful in TLS 1.2? No. Okay. And do we expect the existing cipher suites to be meaningful in TLS 1.3? No. Okay. They're, they're, we're just shoving in the same field. Right. I, I think that's useful for people who are thinking about fallback logic and, yeah. and, and that. Just to, make, to be clear that these are sort of partitions of. Yeah. The, and my implementation treats it that way. So is there a column? Are we going to put a column in the cipher suites registry that says, oh, 1.3 yes no and 1.2 yes no. I, I, I was thinking we just name them differently, but I could put a column in too. It seems we, like it we seems already like have he this problem. That, that these things are are relevant for 1.2 and these things are right. relevant for 1.2. Yeah, so, so, so we have we already have a 1.3 yes no. We don't have a 1.2 yes no, but we could we can we, we change that column to say 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 version instead of yes no. Yeah. So so Martin Thompson, we we already have that problem with the existing set of cycle suites in NSS. There's this great big case statement that that says you know this this cipher suite is good for this range of versions and some of them only go so far as i think we have some that are ssl3 only and some that are only 10 and 11 and some that it's 12 only and this actually simplifies it a whole lot more what it does mean though that when you when you commit to a version, you really commit to that version, and that's actually a good thing, I think. That, that, that's actually true for every implementation I know. They'll they negotiate version first, and then right. they try I to mean, make sense of things. It's the only sensible thing to do. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, agreed. Oh, great. I'm sorry. I wasn't disagreeing with you. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's the most sensible thing to do, which is com commit to the version, and if something fails from then on because you've only been offered Cypher suites that are no good for that version, well, someone's screwed up then. That's all. Okay, we haven't seen the PSK portion of this, and I know you're all eagerly awaiting that. So but I want to make sure that there's people in general are, I haven't heard anybody come up and say, this is just a non-starter. And if anybody feels that, okay. So should we move on sure. to the? Yeah. So the PSK, unfortunately, we, 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 we valiantly tried to like make this simple and we think we made it as simple as we can. Um, we had some initial ideas that were like, we like invent the signature schemes and like key shares called PSK. So the, sorry. Here's the underlying problem. The underlying problem is that PSK can be is not used necessarily on its own. It can combine with the elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman or with Diffie-Hellman key exchange, and we don't currently allow it. We have a proposal from Martin Thompson to allow you to combine it with a signature from the server. And so, um, so the, the, the motivation for this in fact was trying to figure out how to express that that semantic, namely. Um, namely, I would like to do PSK, but I like the server to demonstrate to me he still controls the, his private key. Um, and I can go into the motivation for that if you want, but um, I'm just saying like, that's something you'd like to be able to express, um, uh, at least in principle, even if you decided we didn't let people say it. Um, so the difficulty is forget finding, finding a way to say that. Um, so we had a bunch of ideas that were like, we'll have these fake, as I say, we'll have these fakes, um, you know, key shares that were like, I would like to take only PSK. And so if you offered like, if you offered, you know, the PSK key share, then that meant I just do PSK. And if you offered the, the if you offered only Diffie Hellman key shares, that meant you DHE PSK. And that didn't really work out very well. Um, so what we finally came up with um, is I actually sent two versions of the list, but I'll show you the one I like better, which is basically put taking all this complexity um, such as it is and shoving into PSK itself, PSK indicators themselves. So that, that makes the public key stuff easier um, and puts the problem where it really, where it was created. So the idea is basically to have two um, two sub indications in the in in the PSK um, identifiers themselves or the PSK proposals that say you may you may use this PSK th th these these are from the client to the server dear server you may use this PSK um, alone or you may use this PSK with Diffie Hellman or you could do either at right? your choice and uh, as usual in TLS these are ordered lists so um, um, now. Probably it's not probably not really sensible to say it's probably not really sensible to say both of them, but you might want to for some reason, or we might add a third thing, right? Um, so the um, so basically what happens is the client sends the server a list of keys, um, and it says uh, as usual, and it says if you use this key, you must like also sign, or you must or you must also sign, or you may sign or not at your discretion, and similarly you may use a DHE or not, um, and then the server responds with the one he's picked and what he's actually going to do. Um, 
Now, I think the first half of this is obvious, um, namely the client says, like, well, here's what you can do and the server has to pick out of it. Um, the second half is less obvious. Um, I'll get to that in a second. Um, we also, of course, take these exact same bits and you shove them in the session in the new session ticket message so that the server can tell the client what you could actually in principle do. So you don't have a situation where the server like only supports ECDHE resumption and the client says, I only want PSK resumption. So you so you want to give the, so the client has to be given some idea what, what he can do. Um the um right. So the um why does the server have to tell you anything? Uh so the server actually does not have to tell you whether he's doing Diffie Hellman or not because you can infer that from the key show the server sends you. What the server has to tell you is whether he's going to sign or not. And the reason you want to, wanted to tell you that is that that way when you're processing the messages from the server, you know whether you're looking for a certificate and certificate verify rather than having to just go, is there one there? What the heck am I doing? Um, so, um, so anyway, so that's so, it, right? So that, so, uh, and, and of course, these happen during phases of the handshake. Namely, you need to know that the, 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 the Diffie Hellman phase, even to get through the client, the server, the server hello. But the rest of it, you need you, you want to process the sequence. Um, so, I'm, I'm less happy about this last indication here. Um, namely, it's not clear why you're sending why you're sending the key exchange because, as I say, it's kind of redundant. It's an opportunity to get it wrong. Um, and um, this is not like my favorite way of indicating. Um, well, maybe my favorite way, but it's not, not a pretty elegant way of indicating whether you're going to sign or not. Um, the other major alternative I've seen for testing how you're going to sign or not will be to strike both those bits out of the identity, um, both those lists, and to have the server send you a um, signature algorithms indicator, an extension in his server hello. And if he sent that, that meant he's going to sign. If he didn't send it, meant he wasn't going to sign. Um, um, actually, that could go into encrypted extensions as well. So there's some debate on which of these alternatives is more aesthetic or not. Um, um, I guess um, I'll let that debate commence, but let me first say that we're not using that signature algorithms thing for anything right now, so that would be okay. But we discussed using it for something, something it would not be okay. Um, so, uh, so, so anyway, uh, there's a number of ways to indicate that, but um, and I don't want to get too bogged down in this particular encoding because there's at least one other encoding we discussed that involves, you know, flagged words instead of instead of uh, lists. But I think that um, this is like generally higher post this negotiation. Um, I've um, yeah. Yeah. So, so Martin Thompson, ultimately this really is just flags, just a question of representation. Yes. Um, the, the, having the auth mode in there and having a signal avoids a, a number of the problems that we might have analogous to some of the, um, smack TLS stuff that, that Karthik was doing a few years ago on implementations that, that failed to actually, um, apply keys in certain circumstances. And if you looked at the um, if you looked at the the key um, schedule that you had on uh, on the previous slide, there is actually an opportunity to have two like no entropy yeah. entered, and that gives implementations a, a hook to look at and say, I expect to see entropy coming in at these points, and you can actually sanity check it. It's not like you can avoid having checks in there, which is a little unfortunate. We've tried to avoid. Uh, forcing checks on people, but I think this is a really, a really neat way of making sure that you actually have entropy entering at the right points in time. Of course, it's PSK, so you're always going to have PSK, but it means that you, yeah. you avoid all of the the sort of extra checking, and you know what you're checking checking for ahead of time. Okay, so, I don't so, like the KE mode in the in the um, server indication of the thing. I think it's just Right. I, I guess I think I think the, I think the invariant is that you must tell that the, the server must tell the client what he's going to do, so that right. the client can't infer it. Right. And, and I think he can't infer that he's going to sign the key. He can maybe infer, but maybe nice to double check it. Yeah. Uh, and I have designs on signature algorithms, so <laughs> don't don't, don't use, use it. Right. Deb. Deb Kuliana, say. So I don't quite understand how this works but is there like at all um okay <laughs> is there a way to make your chinese menu just included we couldn't figure it out doesn't mean it doesn't mean doesn't mean doesn't mean that it can't be done but we couldn't figure it out yeah, so is it just another orthogonal piece yes but the problem is it's not totally orthogonal so so i mean i i I, I didn't. I, I spent like much of yesterday actually implementing this because I wanted to actually be able to talk coherently about it. Um, so the um, what you have to do to make this work um, is 
you basically say provisionally, I'm going to accept this PSK and then validate essentially that everything is consistent as you try to pick the rest of the parameters. And then if any point is not consistent, you just abandon the PSK and fall back to and you, and you basically are running the regular negotiation quasi parallel. Um, so uh, it's, it's, it's easier than it sounds. Um, <laughs> um, okay. Um, but basically, basically, let's, let's talk. Let's talk about the. Um, um, let, let, um, yeah. Uh, let me ask you one more follow-on yeah. question, and that is: Can I now use PSK to add just to KE without using it as an auth? Um. So, so what? What? Let, let me let me try to answer that crisply. Um, you could use you. Th this would allow you to express. I would like a key that is based purely on a PSK, but I would like you to sign to prove you who you are. Um, yes. Yes, th this would allow you to say that. So or a PSK with a ECDH -E yes. combination, and then I want you to sign to prove who Yes, you this are. would allow you to say that as well. Awesome. Hi, Nick Sullivan. So one of the things <clears throat> that hasn't been mentioned that we lose in this proposal is the ability to signal client preferences for more than just the AAD and PRF. Uh, it, are there any thoughts on how to bring back the client preference in all these other separate pieces so, of the So this, this actually does, um, because each of these other things is also ordered, you actually do signal the client preferences. Um, so if you go back to the previous slide, I guess. Um, is this made explicit? Uh, yeah, so everyone in the spec that there's a list of things, it says um, it says clients preferences first. Okay, including this, which, Inclu is, yeah, no, which is another advantage of this. There's no the spec for this, but yes, it right. would say that. That's that's in fact that's the advantage of this encoding okay, rather yeah. than the bitmask encoding mask. Yeah. Okay. Um, so one thing I do want to mention is that these um, this that parenthetical new is exactly referring to the case that Deb was just indicating. Um, so we don't yet have any security analysis, any cryptographic analysis for this mode, but the motivation for the resumption context was precisely Karthik's um, attempt to make sure that that mode was safe. So we have to have analysis for it, but that the, the, one of the motivations would be exactly to allow that, that, that mode. Uh, yeah, Rick, so I was kind of channeling for the whole chat room. Um, so I guess the PSK stuff, you know, be handled purely at the API level, right? Because you have to persist stuff from previous attempts. You have to persist stuff for PSK from previous attempts. Not necessarily. No, so I mean, so so I mean, so our implementation, um, our implementation, I believe the Chrome implementation, when it does it, probably um, treats PSK as if it were session resumption and hides it under the covers. Um, in fact, so one of the well, another advantage of this design is that when we had, is that you would, uh, is it in, um, is it you be nego is it in the previous version you would like negotiate. TLS, PSK, ECDHE with AES 120 HECM, um, but you pre based on your previous negotiation of, with, with with you know ECDHE with ECDSA, and then a lot, and then in order to keep TLS API consistency, we have to like lie about the you have to lie about the cipher suite upward and be like, well, I'm not really negotiating PSK, I'm really negotiating ECDHE, right? And so um, this is a limit. It creates a different class of lies, but it's a simpler class of lies. Okay, it's a more truthful lie. Yeah. All right. <laughs> well, I, mean, I, I guess. I guess. Yeah. Um. All right. The, the second thing is, um, how do, how are you guys configuring it in terms of like you know, yeah, everyone's favorite OpenSSL ciphers. Yeah. So I so I think I think actually OpenSSL ciphers are actually probably pretty straightforward because those are quasi orthogonal in any case. I mean they're a mess, yeah. but. Um, I mean. Yeah. I, I guess it's gonna have to have a sub separator character inside the. Colon separated. I'm thinking maybe David Ben can talk about this. Yeah, not in terms of, we, we actually have um, stuff in NSS now that allows you to do that sort of thing with the language and all that right. sort of other stuff. And we have APIs that will turn on and off named groups independently. I don't think we can order those. Um, order and turn on and off signature algorithms, order and turn on and off um, Cypher Suites or the AAD PRF. I mean, it's it's just all part of the existing yeah. stuff that we have. So, so, I mean, so, so what you would do here, by the way, I mean, to configure these these modes, either the, either the either the either the uh, stack would just take a position on it and not let you not let you decide, or the stack would have some separate fraud that would say, "Do you insist on Diffie Hellman when you do resumption or not?" Basically, yes. Yeah, David Benjamin. Um, basically, that I think the so for the open SSL type cipher suites, um, most of the information in a cipher in a TLS one two cipher suite that's not the AAD and PRF is already like basically irrelevant in TLS one three. Uh, like all of our ciphers look like ECDHE, and the part where you have RSA or ECDSA in the cipher was like always kind of weird. Um, so I think 
the implementation can decide exactly what they want to do, but I could imagine any sort of thing where you like maybe post process the list to extract the like AADs you actually ended up picking, or maybe you say that like, okay, if you put a cipher suite by name, then we won't match the TLS131. And so you really need to say like the, the selectors, but that might like, I, I think probably you'd want to do a post process and extract the, 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 the AADs and put them in and that way you can transparently turn 13 on. But uh, like, there's a number of options you could toy with depending on what exactly what backwards compatibility constraints your implementation has and or not, but it's solvable. What one advantage of uh, what we have with one three is that all the safer suites that are accessible with one three are basically strong, and so you're, uh, and, and and so if you're, like you don't have to do configure it to have it not do crazy things. Today, Today yes. Uh, this is DKG. Um, I. Uh, so I think this is a good a good process, but thinking about implementation side and uh, deployment side and being an administrator or operator of a client, um, I'm wondering whether the implementers who've done this and who've thought about preference ordering and things could agree to, and perhaps document, perhaps in a draft, um, a textual string representation of how client preferences can be represented and how server preferences can be represented. Because the open SSL ciphers for 1.2 and prior is kind of a mess. Um, and there are other TLS implementations that don't speak that particular yes. dialect. But if we had a clear statement of here's a textual representation of these preferences for both client and server, then everyone who's implementing it could just adopt that and we'd have a much easier time going forward. I think we'd be at least amenable to discussing it. Um, I, I mean, you would need you would need multiple axes as opposed to what you have now, right? Sure. but but. I mean, presumably there is still some textual representation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's okay. I mean, JSON or something, right? But um, <laughs> maybe maybe Cbor, <laughs> base sixty four encoded Cbor, DKJ. So, awesome. so this is Debbie Cooley from NSA. So the reason I was standing in the back was I was going to ask you at the end of all of this how you were going to document security considerations for this. Yes. Program, because you're going to need to help. Yeah. Everybody else that's implementing this. Yeah. To do it. And, and it would be wonderful if you were recommending that things were matchy matchy. You know what I mean, right? Um, <laughs> I know you guys love matchy matchy. No, I yeah we do. We're obsessed. Um, but you know because that's what you want to aim for, right? Is to have things be sort of sameish. I'm not sure David does, but. <laughs> Yeah, I guess I'm actually about to say the opposite thing. Uh, for for to DKG's point about having the common language, we've like actually so unless you want to do matchy matchy things, in which case I'd have to think about it. But uh, if you don't want to do matchy matchy things, we like don't need a language anymore because the only like you just have like several lists and like okay, the string form is we decide a string name for each AAD, which is already in the spec. The thing that makes like open SSL things more complicated is that we have these like semi orthogonal but not quite orthogonal things, and people probably want to say like. People want to, people for some reason want to say interesting things like give me all RC4 ciphers. Well, I hope you don't actually want to say give me all RC4 ciphers, but because of that, you end up having these like weird selector combinator type right. languages. But if it's just a list of like like things with concrete interfaces, then there's no need to say anything. Right. Else. In fact, the, I mean the way you say it right now, the way you say give me all RC4 ciphers, or you couldn't say that, but uh, the way you say give me all RC4 ciphers would be you know to define AED RC4. And say like, and then add that to the list, and that be yeah. it should be done, right? I think I think you you've nailed exactly the problem. The reason these interfaces are so clunky is that we have something which we have something which is which is quasi orthogonal, and they're trying trying to describe it in a quasi orthogonal way, but neither the description language nor the target are actually orthogonal, but they're not orthogonal in different ways. Or another way to say it is that you would never actually want to say in your language, "Give me all GCM cipher suites," or "Give me all cipher suites that like have counter mode in them somewhere." You'd like probably just list out the AADs. Well, it's not even a coherent statement now, right? Okay. So this is DKG. Just to clarify, uh, I don't think it's fair to say you don't even need a language. I'm, what I'm what I'm saying is, if, even if it's really simple, write down a concrete representation for it in string form that can be passed to the different pieces. If, if we have that and we have a standard way to do that, then it will be much easier to like work with different deployment stacks. So even if it's just stupid simple, a draft that says you take these things, you separate them with commas, you stick colons between these things, this is how you know what they are. Like, yeah, let's get it, let's get it clear so that we don't have five different variants and I have to go. Would you be willing to help with that? Yeah, sure, fine. I'd be willing to work on it if you'd be willing to work on it. Yeah, Rick, Rick Sauls, just to emphasize DKG's things and being more sarcastic about it, I mean, 
representing OpenSSL, we've got a lot more clients than the one each that NSS and Boring have. <laughs> yeah. We be I think I think I'd be happy to work on something like that. If, if if the people I guess if the people who had stacks are willing to work on it, like I don't want to define something nobody uses. Yeah, I, I also think that sounds like a good idea. I, I would ask though that you at least consider the, the possibility that some cipher suites go bad or some algorithms go bad in doing that. So you might want a not possibility. Because 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 your point your point is there's a default. Your your point is that's how you express the default. The default is on, and you want to turn it off. Yeah, I mean, if, if you look at the kind of configurations people want, is uh, over time in like five or ten years, sure. you might say, I like everything except. Well, this. I, mean, I mean, I mean, this is this is this is something I mean, which we have to talk about actually the draft, but the inter interaction like is this designed to provide a complete profile of everything you want, or is it defi is it designed to be somehow merged with some existing set of preferences, which are, which are in the implementation, is exactly the API choices that biggest difficulty here. Um, so, like NSS, for instance, has got like some its own set of API choices, right? And its own set of default implementations. And you, um, you know, and then you can turn them on or off. But if you don't do anything, you get something, right? And uh, so, okay, next slide. So, I guess when we started doing this, but um, you know, obviously, this is a big change at the last minute. But um, and um, uh, and it makes the on um, on it careful it makes the makes the the programming API about this easy it makes the downward API easier and it makes the upward API slightly more complicated um, in the sense that the upward API people are used to like being able to say give me the cipher suite so people have adopted an idiom which is not the right idiom but nevertheless an idiom they adopted of just give me the cipher suite that tells me everything I want to know about the, about what's going on right and um, and that's not that's not really true because like because it doesn't tell you for what elliptic curve group was, was 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 negotiated, but people have been doing it anyway. And so people will have to adapt, or the implementation will have to sort of lie and fake up some cipher suite to tell tell you what it did. Um, so that will make the upward interface um, a little more hairy, but it'll make the downward interface actually quite a bit easier. Um, There's nothing stopping an implementation from formulating that language on its own. Microsoft have been reporting the um, the elliptic curve group in the cipher suite for a very long time. Yeah. And you could just synthesize a whole yes, bunch of strings that yes. had all the various combinations. I mean, you wouldn't be able to turn off just one of them. Yeah. But yeah, they still do all the reports. Absolutely. I just I just I just fresh in my mind. Um I think the big con is it doesn't let you adjust these non orthogonal all parts points in the space, but I actually I'm have come to the conclusion that was a mistake to uh to, to attempt to, to to facilitate. Um I think the pros are um you know this is like a lot easier to write your code. Um so um, the evidence that we have is David's opinion, my opinion, Martin's opinion, and actually my prototype implementation, um, which you know, no doubt is full of but horrible, horrible bugs, but like at least does sort of does do something, um, and um, so it's much cleaner. Um, it removes the sort of odd, um, you know, uh, the, the, the sort of uh, the, the ECDHA PSK server switch, which were always kind of gross, um, and it's 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 more expressive in a number of ways. So. Um, uh, I, as I say, I resisted, resisted this for a long time, um, but on balance, I think this is the right decision to make. Um, so my proposal here is that I, I guess I'd like to get people sense that if they want this, and if they want this, then I'll produce a PR in the, like probably this week, and if not, really next week, and um, you know, provisionally adopt this pending actually producing text. So that's how I propose you proceed, I guess. Okay. Any any more discussion on that? If not, we'll take a hum. Okay, so the, the questions will be, uh, do you support um, moving to a menu approach for the Cypher Suites uh, versus uh, keeping it in this mon monolithic Cypher Suite representation? So first question will be, do you support this change? And the second question will be, do you oppose this change? So uh, for those in the room, how many people, or how many if you support uh, making this change to a menu-based Cypher Suite system. Okay, how many of you are, are opposed to making this change? Okay. So all strike when the iron is hot. You'll see a PR real soon. Um, okay, next slide. Um, oh yeah, right. <laughs> so it turns out that if you if you send you know a client hello with um, version three comma four in the client hello field in the, in the client version field, 
some non-trivial fraction of servers choke. Um, we're not sure what that number is, but some, the percent or so seems to be the sort of the sort of number people think about. Um, and so, until recently, I would have said all existing browsers. Um, so again, I'm thinking thinking, thinking of browser guy. It's like amazing how fast you yeah, you go to the browser company, you think of a browser guy. Like it used to be that stupid browsers. But, um, so anyway, um, you know, um, non-browser systems basically don't worry about this because. By and large, you know, you just tell people to upgrade one side or the other, and you don't worry about it. But if you're a browser, you have to worry about this. And the browsers, um, basically, had until recently had this logic called fallback, and they basically be like, if anything goes wrong with this with the connection, and you offered like you know the maximum thing you should you should, should do, try like offering something cruddier and see if the other guy takes it. And maybe if he takes it, you're happy. And that's like, and and I should mention that's actually been like um, a really useful feature because it's how we got rid of RC4 basically. Um, uh, but it's also kind of a pain to implement. Um, um, but as I say, it's also been very useful because it's like basically the way you got RC4, courtesy of Andre, was you would like not offer RC4 and then the servers would choke and you'd fall back to offering RC4. And that meant that like there were lots of people who, because there were like lots of people who would pick RC4 if you gave it to them, but if you didn't give it to them, it actually would negotiate something else. So, um, so as I say, I used to say everybody does this. Um, um, then some guy at Google pulled this out of the stack. And um, so David came and like yelled at me for a while about how much this sucked and how really we should not recapitulate this mistake, this alleged mistake in TLS 1.3. Um, the mistake being obviously um, that having a version negotiation mechanism, which apparently is like too complicated for people to do, like comparing two numbers. And um, and so people screwed up. And so um, and so we just ain't different. So uh, um, again, resisted this for a long time. And, and I'm not taking a position on this, but I figured we should discuss it. Um, so. Um, David has proposed something, this is my stylized version of what David proposed, um, and we can discuss it now. Um, so the proposal is basically to keep the client hello version as it is, offer 3, 3, which is TLS 1.2, um, and then have a new extension, which basically is a list of the versions to support. Now you might've thought that you could just have, you could just, you could just recapitulate the version number in there, like as the maximum version. Um, um, rather than having a list of extensions, but uh, a list of versions, but there's a reason for giving a list of versions we'll get to in a second. So basically you say, here's a list of all the versions I support, and we could we could fight about how they could be encoded, whether they, whether it should be like whether you start at zero or they should start basically where you start now, and whether um and whether you should list the ones that are like before TLS some point three or not. Um but anyway, um and then the server just picks whatever he likes out of this list. And this list, I guess, is quasi ordered in some way, but who knows? I guess in traditional TLS style, it's probably ordered in, in like in your preference order. Um, and then David's proposal is that the server would contain the negotiate the server hello, however, would contain his version field, the a negotiated version, which in this case is higher than the version that the client was in the client hello. Um, and um, and then we and then we negotiate all future versions this way. And in order to keep this um, keep this functionality live, David would periodically send you like insane cipher, insane insane versions um, that you were hopefully not going to support, and trust the, and, and 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 trust you didn't choke. And if you choked, then David would come to your house and kill you. Um, <laughs> David Benjamin. So uh, yeah, I want to do that to basically every single list we have. I want to burn a range of cipher suites, extensions, and everything. I'll just make Chrome pick random fake ones in every client hello. I'm like kind of tired of fighting this intolerance game. We almost had to roll back X25019 because it turns out some ancient Erlang TLS implementation barfed and like I want to be done with this. So uh, Yeah, so I actually want to burn something dumb like the two numbers x or to 42 that like you can't possibly determine, but I think Iana will probably kill me. So uh, like, <laughs> I think if it's a range, like I want to get, like I don't, so if an implementation is actively trying to be intolerant, then like, okay, you're, you're like, I, you lose and I'm going to just break your server. Um, but like, I, what I want to get to the point is that like, if you, don't, if you like make a mistake in your implementation, like you will not interoperate with the vast, with like, Hopefully, more than just Chrome does this, and you will not interoperate with a large number of clients, and then you will realize that, like, hmm, maybe there's something weird here. I should like ignore unknown versions. I think the Erlang one, they like did a switch case and forgot a default, and I guess the way you write do things in Erlang is you just like crash the process because it. I don't, I don't actually know Erlang, but anyway, so like hopefully they would notice that and be like, oh, I should add a default case before they actually ship the software. Because the problem is right now, like the existing clients will by definition interoperate with whoever would like servers people put out. The problem is that like n years down the line when we want to exercise a, a like little exercise protocol joint that then realize, oh, they actually could only handle the ones that existed today. 
Um, but if we have fake ones, then I'm hoping this will work because right. everything else seems not to have worked. Right. So anyway, I'm, I'm presenting this for your discussion. Um, uh, I, I, it, it is revolting. It may be right. I'm not sure about that, but it's, I think we can all agree it's revolting. Um, um, so uh, we, we need to decide this. Um, uh, um, one thing I wanted to briefly mention is that the mechanism we've been using for allegedly preventing um, interrupt failures with draft versions, um, as David pointed out to me, does not work well. Um, so right now what we do is you advertise version 1.3 and you put in an extension that says, I'm draft version 47 or whatever, and the other people are supposed to not do 1.3 with you. But as David pointed out to me, what that means is, is that when you actually field the final version, then either then, 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 the, then the servers have to like, for a very long time, look for old draft versions and reject them um, until basically all those people have expired from the internet. Um, and so that means makes, means you shouldn't means you can't ship any draft versions in ESRs or anything like that because you need them to time out. Um, so that's unfortunate. So um, this would solve that problem as well. But um, yeah. there are, there are downsides to this as well. I think which are obvious too. Yeah. So um, Martin Thompson, the I, I really don't like this. I'd I'd rather we stop after the first bullet point. Um, and the reason I say that is that you're worried about all of our extension points seizing up. So let's just add another one. Um, I would rather us just say if there is a particular extension present, maybe KeyShare is the one. I, that is that the only new one that we can guarantee will be present. That we can't even guarantee it's going to be present, can we? Right. So if there were if there were some combination of extensions that were already guaranteed to be present, we could just walk. KeyShare or PSK must be present. Ch present. Ch well, is PSK new? It's old, isn't it? No. Oh, it's, it's new? It's new. It's new. So yeah. we're done. Um, either one of those two are present, then you're doing TLS 1.3. And if someone wants to do TLS 1.4 or TLS version 70, um, then they put a new extension in and see. So, so and that, I, that remains the signal. So it's worth, then we don't it's have worth, any, any more extension points. Right. So I guess one thing to say about this is that the alternate version of this design is to simply have a I support TLS 1.3 extension. Um, yes. As and opposed, to, what as opposed to the sub list, right? Um, so um, I presented this version because it's slightly more compact. But um, if, if for some reason you think that's the right design, like obviously that's essentially the same aesthetic, the same aesthetic properties. Yeah, so I, I would prefer to have, I support version 1.3 one, one extension, simply because it's, it's fewer point, joints to seize up. Um, yeah, David Benjamin, I'm happy with either. Uh, if, but like, I, I, I think we can defend extensions in the version list equally, but like, you know, uh, the, 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 so if we always have a new mandatory extension every version, then that's more compact. If we don't, then this is more compact. I, I really don't care. Um, well, there's one thing to say about this is a new extension would not let you indicate preference order. That's what we have now. Hannoberg, uh, I like the general thinking behind this proposal, like that you say we kind of test by sending stupid versions, um, but this changes a whole lot of things, I think, from the logic. Like with this, you could say things like I support SL version 3 and TLS 1.2, but not TLS 1.1 and 1.0. I'm not sure if that has other implications, like that you now have a list of versions instead of a range and yeah. But yeah, that's and quite also right. Also, it, it adds like another indirection. Like people in the future will wonder, right? We have this version in the hello, and then this other version in the, Just which correct. then only has historic reasons. Yeah. So, Bode also pointed out that this lets people effectively do sort of unofficial forks, like that you do, like you know, I support Tails version nine hundred twenty-two, and um, and nobody. I mean, so that is useful for draft for draft revisions, but it's unuseful because you might cope with stopping. So this is Deb Cooley again. Um, so uh, this is ugly. And it makes it more complicated. And if you just left it the way that it was, you can still do the unofficial fork thing by saying three dot, yes. three comma, whatever the heck you want. I would much prefer to send David to kill them to begin with. <laughs> well, he does, he does. He does have Valdez and Harper now, so maybe there's enough manpower to. Or have David come to me because there's probably servers in an area that I have influence over, and we can make them freaking right. update. <laughs> right? Because it's yeah. old stuff you're yeah. talking about. Make them fix it. Damn it. And that—that that has been my position for a very long time, um, and, and I'm still. 
I, I have a certain amount of adherence. However, position. I'm not a browser vendor, so. Yeah. Well, we already have this code. We already have this fallback code. So we, we're not. It's David. It's David who took it out. Who foolishly took it out? <laughs> like you know. Yeah, Chrome does not fall back anymore. I've deleted the code. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, what was I going to say? I don't remember what I was going to say. <laughs> so. <laughs> Mike Bishop, just commenting. Didn't we already have this conversation with CLS one two? Because we certainly played this game then. I don't. I, I think when one two was defined, I don't think I don't think it was as widely. One two didn't have as much as much uh, browser manufacturer involvement when it was designed, and so I think basically it wasn't as widely known. I'm not sure I knew that this that people did this, and so I don't think this just didn't come up. Okay. Um, and then and then basically then people started realizing they had to fall back, but it wasn't a. Um, I mean, also the fact one, that one, one, two, one, I think also basically one two was one two was defined before people knew about this basically. Uh, hi, Antoine again. Um, so I have uh, some comments again. Um, so one thing that was removed in one three is um, before in TLS there was a branch version negotiation mechanism through the um, um, re record version in the client hello basically. What you would do is you would put your minimal client version in the outer um, uh, records and your maximum one in the client hello itself. And uh, this is no longer possible because uh, new TLS 1.3 requires to put 1.0 in the record. Right. Uh, so it's, well, it never it never worked, right? I mean, 1.2. If you read the 1.2 spec, there's a section on like this is what you can. There's no value you can safely put here, but this is the value we suggest you put here, basically. Yeah, but I mean. This is, it sounds like a case where you, you, I mean, this sounds like two outrageous proposals. One, one is uh, getting rid of the historical version negotiation, because uh, basically if we don't put 3.3 in, in client hello, then there won't be any more version negotiation through the protocol version, which is quite upsetting. And uh, using another even more outrageous proposal to make it accept this one, because we can basically do it based on any one that resifes you or any signal. But uh, still, what, what what is the the long term plan for dealing with uh, protocol version negotiation uh, as historically defined in the protocol itself? Seems like a much better approach to uh, have the the chromes and uh, uh, it's for, I don't know for the fifty five uh, protocol version in the client hello and and force these guys to update. <laughs> I think it's Eric. Um, Eric Nygren, the, the, I like the idea of having the explicit list of supported versions. I guess one question though is whether, do we have a sense how much of the version negotiation problems we're having are from servers versus um, unfortunate middle boxes that are looking at the clear text because, and trying to enforce some policies because that would make this worse. Because this, yeah, this is not gonna help that, that may actually make those worse rather than rather than um, fix up some of those problems, even though it might help with the okay. servers. And that is a measurement we could take. We're still pending a measurement on the record layer, so. so uh, David Benjamin, so the intolerant middle boxes are all dead and gone, and I hope they stay that way, because like we deployed fallback as CSV, and I assume if we end up not doing this and having a fallback for 1.3, we'll use the, um, uh, what's it, the downgrade protection in the server random. So. If it's so, if the fallback works, it will only be if the endpoint is intolerant and not the middle box. Uh, or, so, like, I, I well, no, I but, it could, but, could, but it could be the middle boxes that, that explicitly check for version number matching and choke on that, and this would break them, and otherwise wouldn't break anybody yeah, else. That's true. That's true. I mean, that's great. I suppose those middle boxes probably check all the other parameters of the server hello and also choke, but I'm just saying it's conceivably possible. <laughs> ben Schwartz. I think there might be a way to get both of these benefits. So if we uh, if we just increment client hello, like normal versioning people, but then uh, if the ITF agrees to take like six months off at least between uh, between version numbers, then for those six months, browsers can lie upwards about their version number in client hello and break any servers that are intolerant for that period and basically for as long as needed until they're fixed. And once they're fixed, then the IETF can start developing version N plus one. Uh, and the browsers need a time limit at least so that they stop reporting N plus one after a fixed time period. <laughs> That's a horrible idea, but I'm not sure we're horrible than this. You, you first. Okay. 
Christian Wittema, Microsoft. I'm worried about particular use case of all the new IoT systems and others which want to have a simple software and they want probably to negotiate that they only support 1.3 and do not want to fall back to 1.2. And in that case, the uh, extension approach that Martin was proposing just doesn't work because it doesn't convey that semantic. Got to answer that one. So, if you only want to do one one point three, and don't want to do one point two, and the server is inclined to pick one point two, guess what? You don't have any anything in common. That, that's correct. But so it fails. You're keying off. If you key off the cipher suites, right? Because we now have disjoint one point three and one point two cipher suites. So, if you only do one point three, then you offer the extensions, and your list of cipher suites must not include any one point two cipher suites. But basically, if, if what I want to say is I want to do that, you can effectively rely on your safety net that it's going to fail in some crashy way and, and, and you just crash the connection. Or you can exactly say that, well, I just want to do that. It fails when you get the first response from the server. What's the problem? <laughs> Should we change that? David Benjamin, I just wanted to make a, a comment to uh, the, uh, so if instead of this having the browsers fake a uh, higher version, um, I actually considered doing that, but I think it's a little bit too late now. So the problem is we need, so say, say we all agreed that like TLS 1.3 is not going to exist until 2018. Uh, 1.14 you mean? Oh, oh 1.4, okay, so you're, so you're saying like. He's saying we accept the fallback now, Okay. and then we rebuild the joint Next okay, sure. In, in a year. Like, like the, the, the the new sense is that you need to stop new implementation. You, you need to stop the implementations from getting to the ecosystem first. Like once they're in the ecosystem, like I can't break them. I can only like I can add a fallback and monitor, and then like I'll, I'll, I can tell everyone, okay, guys, it's safe to turn on TLS one for now. But uh, I, I would much rather prevent it from existing in the first place. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, as I understood Ben's plan, it would it would be that we would do what you get. You would basically you we have the fallback. You get the one point three. You get to the point where you could remove the 1.3 fallback, then you remove it. You start advertising. You start advertising 1.4 and basically pitching at people, right? Sure. I, actually, I think probably that in in that case, I would just pretend to be 1.4 in the very first version of 1.3 we ever put yeah, out, yeah. and just like only ratchet that back down when we're ready. Yeah, so that it's works. A little yeah. bit odd, but I guess it yeah. might work. Yeah. So I guess what I would suggest is that is the choice here is between keep the existing version mechanism versus adding. Something that is like there's a, there's a different one that like that deprecates the old version mechanism and and either that's and either that's like one of n different things people propose namely this proposal or Martin's proposal or or you know some other to be defined um, you know uh, you know bike shedding of the of the negotiations attacks because um, I, I think that's the big question is should we like keep the existing mechanism versus move in the new mechanism that is uh, you know that basically use an existing safe nominally safe thing. Um, okay, so uh, that that means we think implementers are smarter now that, than they were. That is the objection. That is the objection to this this, this suggestion, right? Um, so, so specifically, this is not assuming implementers are smarter now because I'm just going to make Chrome always fit, make send fake versions. So like, right. the, the implementers okay. will not be able to get this. <laughs> like, they will not be able to shift their code, get this wrong, and interop with Chrome. And like, hopefully, other browsers will be like in on this game too. As as distasteful as I find this, like I will say, it has the benefit that when we decide to throw it away in the future, you can we we don't have these like vestigial bits hanging around. So like we have the vestigial uh, version octets. If we add this thing, only the client hello and the, the server hello. We're gonna send this one. Andre Bob of Microsoft. Uh, so there are advantages and disadvantages to this. I think. Uh, this is a different version negotiation mechanism for for 1.3, uh, which has even you know UI configuration, UI implications, for example, right? So in the past you had to have a range. Yeah. Now you can have this contiguous kind of selections checkbox style you know thing, and which one to use depends on the version. So that that can be pretty confusing to the user if you if you are to express this in the UI. Uh, on the other hand, the advantage is that you know if you have a non-standard version of TLS, as some countries do. 
you could express in, in, in this format, I think you could negotiate it more, yeah. more easily. So pluses and minuses. <laughs> yeah, before you were insane to said it. Uh, Philhan Baker, this problem seems to come up again and again. And it's rather sad that it comes up again and again because it seems to be rather core to the idea of creating standards. And so I, I, I would like, I think one of the problems here is that people don't quite understand what they want from version versioning and when they want to break things and when they don't want to break things. And I think that maybe one of the things we should do here is to kick the IAB and say, you should have a plan for this and you should have a, an architecture that uh, working groups can apply and maybe it'll, we don't keep doing it. Tommy, Polly, Apple. Um, so as a browser slash operating system implementation, I think I prefer to keep the existing versioning and live with breaking people and I mean, another approach is if everyone does equally just say break people who don't support the right versioning, then they will get fixed better. Um, if we are going to do something funny, it, the list feels weird because if, like, if someone doesn't know how to support TLS 1.3, they won't know how to support the list. And why would we have a list that can include potentially way older versions? because no one should be using those anymore. So if you're going to have something, just have a like, I'm TLS 1.3, um, but I'd prefer not to. I'd rather just fall back. Martin Thompson, to, to answer Phil's question, there is an IAB document that talks about specifically this problem. Um, I believe it postdates the, the design in TLS. That is part of the problem we have here. Um, and we're really good at ignoring advice. <laughs> And I say that collectively as protocol designers and as implementers, we're really bad at this stuff. Um, we have plenty of evidence to suggest that that's the case, don't we? Ben Schwartz, Jigsaw. I just want to point out, I think the reason we get really concerned in the browser space about this stuff is because there's a, a game theoretic problem where no browser vendor wants to be the one that makes the increment and takes the usability hit and drives users to the other browsers. But I actually don't think that applies here. I, I think that basically we have so many representatives from so many browser vendors so excited about deploying TLS 1.3 that there's basically a sheer force of goodwill can overcome the, the deadlock. Okay, so let's let's get a hum to get a sense of, of where we're at. So the question will be, do you uh, favor changing the current version negotiation mechanism? Up, oh, Hanna. I think we have to consider three options. One is keep the existing mechanism with version fallbacks, or just don't do version fallbacks and break, or um, or have something like this. Uh, I mean, I mean, fallback isn't standardized. We just do it or don't do it. Um, we're not gonna we're not gonna decide whether or not do it based on based on the ITF's decision. Or but we ha I think we have all the people in the room that have to make these decisions at the browsers. If they can agree to break, then we can do it. Uh, David Benjamin, I mean, wait, wait, we like w there's no way to close that fallback today. Yeah, I mean, like the, the way this will work is, I mean, David could speak for Chrome, but the way this is going to work if, if, if we don't change this mechanism is we'll roll out one three, we'll have the fallback code for a while, we'll wait until it gets to an acceptable level, and then we'll, and then we'll put, and, and then maybe we could do a coordinated fallback removal. Yeah, like if the if things stay as is, Chrome will deploy a fallback. I'm sure Firefox will deploy a fallback, and I'm sure the other like major browsers will deploy a fallback too. Like two percent is far too big of a number, and like there are sites like NewYorkTimes.com and Apple.com, and like who knows what else that, like people go to regularly. Yeah. And to be clear, it's not a game theoretic concern; it's a user experience concern. Yeah. Like we're not going to deploy this because it'll break, and some absolute fraction of sites, not because the other guys do it. Yeah, I mean, even if we could all agree to do it, we still wouldn't do it. 
Okay, so we we'll go back to the to the basic question: Is do you support changing the version negotiation mechanism, or do you think that that's a really bad idea? So, question first is: How many if you support changing the version negotiation mechanism? Okay, how many if you think it's a bad idea to change the version negotiation mechanism? Okay. So it sounded like there was more support for I, I didn't have keeping it the same. Uh, yeah, I thought I thought it was pretty strong. Um, I didn't hum. So uh, did you hear differently? Okay. <laughs> I, I abstained. <laughs> um, huh? Okay. Next slide. May I have one last comment on this? Uh, users actually find the current version negotiation mechanism very confusing because they punch a hole in the version list. Sometimes they disable one particular protocol and expect that only that one will be disabled. But what they find, at least, for example, with OpenSSL, is that you disable all protocols above the hole. And so if you disable 1.1, one, one, you also disable 1.2 and 1.3 and, you know, sort of 3, 1, 3, 2, 3, 3, whatever. Uh, you only get that below the hole and weaker. And, and they're totally shocked that's what happens. Well, that seems like a defect in OpenSSL. Um, but, you know, <laughs> but get, getting the semantics for that right and only punching the hole where the client can't communicate to the server. Well, I mean, there's, there's, there's no way for the client to communicate that. I mean, right. the, the, so, I mean like, the, I guess what I'm saying is OpenSSL should, should interpret the hole downward, not a hole upward. I understand the protocol let you say that, but that's what it should do. Uh -huh. Right, but that breaks a little bit in the other direction. So that's why I was humming for the change, but yeah, I don't know if that was communicated here. Okay. Um, uh, right. Okay. Next slide. Um, oh, we're there. Okay. Good. So the current draft implies that you should be able to do client authentication even if you're doing a pre-shared key presumption. Um, and so, why would you ever want this? Uh, okay. But I mean, the, the draft is kind of unclear on the point because like it has an example. It shows you can't, but it has text that says you can. But like the intention, my intention was you're supposed to be able to do this. Um, so. And what happens is it's just like what you expect. The server sends a certificate request in this first flight and like the client responds with it, right? Um, so like the semantics of this are kind of confusing and odd. What, what does it mean? Um, there are two things it can mean. One is, I guess three things. One is the client has not authenticated. Now suddenly the server for some odd reason would like client authentication. Um, the second is the client has authenticated and the server would let the client to prove that he continues to have the, the private key for the certificate. And the third is that the, um, and the, and the third is that the client, um, uh, the, the, for some reason, the server wants a different certificate from the one the client has, has previously advertised, uh, which I guess cases zero and three are kind of zero, one and two, one and three kind of collapse. Um, and so the semantics are kind of confusing and it's kind of a pain to implement. And zero round trip is even, like, even worse because, like, you've already accepted this data provisionally in some cases. And then you have, like, have this extra bit in the state machine that's like, when you finally, when the client finally gets around to sending me data, am I expecting a certificate or am I expecting something else? Um, so, um, the, um, uh, several people, Sabod and others came to me and suggested that, um, that what we should just do is say, like, if you're doing PSK, the server must not send certificate request in the, um, um, in, in, in his server, in his server hello, uh, sorry, his first flight. If he wanted, if he wants, um, to at some point later prompt you for, if he wants, if he decides what he wants is the, is the client's authentication, he must either reject resumption or he must do post anti client authentication. Um, and, um, so that's the proposal that Subod and Nick suggested. Um, David Benjamin suggested an alternate proposal, um, which I think he actually likes less, but just didn't think he could get this good one, um, which is that the client, the, 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 the PSK client auth only is allowed when it's like morally the same identity as the original identity. And so the client can just always basically send your certificate and not, send your empty certificate and not actually use certificate verify. Um, but I, I think you actually like that less well, David, than, than, than main, main proposal. So. Um, I've thought fairly hard about like whether like what what the arguments are for allowing this, and they're in, as far as I can tell entirely protocol symmetry arguments about like why are we making PSK and um, you know why why is it just like all one thing? But I don't think those arguments are as strong as like making implementation simple and um, for something we don't really have much use for. Um, but please discuss. Hannes, um, I think. I think it's a little bit confusing in a, in a way because there are actually two different types of client authentication. So if you only have a PSK, a certificate request from the server uh, doesn't make a lot of sense. However, if you had a PSK in the context of ses session resumption, initially started off with a 
asymmetric cryptography. Yeah. Then the certificate request makes sense because you are not talking about the specific session, but you're actually talking about the earlier, um, the earlier handshake that started off with the. Uh, right. So, so when you say at the last line, proposed resolution ban client OS, to which one are you actually? Uh, what I'm saying is, if you set the PSK, you may not off. If you set the PS, if you if you if you set your server and you send a PSK, you may not send certificate request. Mm -hmm. And any, and any conditions at all. Okay. That would, that would be the puzzle. Um, cause it's so, actually the resumption, it's actually the resumption of zero on trip case that, that is the, that is the case that is the most interest here in terms of simplification. So both, uh, one thing I wanted to add was that this also like introduces as an implementer, this also introduces like, uh, it makes the implementation harder. So this is the only case, for example, in the state machine where you would have to remember like the previous state you were in before. And then, so for example, like when you're sending a zero RTT, uh, when you're sending a zero RTT request, you are expecting, you're in a state where you're expecting end of early data, but you have to remember that after end of early data, you would expect a certificate to come back. So it makes, it's the only case in the state machine where it actually doesn't ratchet forward. It goes like, you have to remember the previous state you were in before your current state. So it makes implementations also like uh, kind of, uh, and it's maybe not that useful to make implementations harder. Yeah, that's absolutely true with the implementation. I ran exactly this problem when I was doing our zero TT part of the stack. Um, and you could just ban it for zero on trip, but I think it's, since I haven't heard any rationale for allowing it at all, like it just seems easier to ban it entirely. Though maybe DET has rationale for allowing it. Um, I'm, I don't know that I do. I, I wanted just to clarify, you're saying that uh, with the main proposal, it makes things easier. And without the main proposal is what's harder? So what's harder is basically that the server sends, the server, the server sends his first flight and then he scrolls through, he reads all the zero round trip data, and then he receives the end of early data. And now he needs to read the client's first handshake message. And so, so, he, so, so initially he's in a state of consume all the zero round trip data, and then he moves to a state of something. And the state of something is either expect certificate or expect finished. And so he has to remember the, he has to remember two bits, you know, two state values rather than one. And so if you say the next thing is always going to be finished, which would be the case if you're ever expecting zero round trip, because if crimes are we, PSK, then you only have to remember, then you always brush the state machine forward to finished. Right. So my point is with the main proposal, it's simpler. Yes. 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 Exactly. Right. Okay. Yep. So, um, and I just, just to clarify, uh, you're saying whenever the server sends PSK, uh, it can't request client auth. So we're not talking about when, when the server sends, say, a session ticket, which is the totally fine. PSK. So, so it's just <clears throat> when the session is being, when, when a connection is being established. That's when you can't do client auth and that connection establishment. Yes, exactly. So if you, uh, here, here's how here's how I would phrase this: If you send the PSK extension in server hello, you must not send certificate request subsequently in that same handshake. Okay. Um, so I so this is Debbie Cool. So this is not just zero round trip. This is and any use of resumption at all. Any oh, this is a resumption. Well, any use of PSK at all. Any use of PSK at all. So this is the this is the dual of the question you asked about the server. Namely, this would allow the server to prove continuous. So the server would be allowed to prove continuous um, possession of a private key, but the client would not be able to. The client, the server, would have to reject resumption to get that that value. Oh, okay. It is. It's it's it's, it's an asymmetry. Um, Ecker, Ecker, um, Jim Shad, are you also banning the post handshake client? No, nope, that'd be fine. Okay. In fact, that would be that would be I, one I of your. I want to make sure because you said yeah. everything. Oh that yeah, that would be one of your two alternatives for getting for forcing cont continuous demonstration of private key. Yeah. Oh. Sorry, one one more attempt at clarification here. Um, when we look at PSK uh, from the client's perspective, yes, uh, one of the options for PSK is that we can claim that the PSK provides us with the servers with authentication of the server simply because yep. it must be the only one with a key. Yes. Uh, so we can also argue uh, the symmetric yes. view, which is that from the server's perspective, the PSK is the client auth in some sense. So in particular, that we're saying that ban certificate-based client auth PSK. Yes. yes. Right. Yes. So if we say, I think if you say that, it's a lot more clear. Yep. That, like there's still a way. This, this is a terrible reason, slide. You can still you can still reason about it and say yes. if we make this ban, you still get client off. You just get the PSK style client off. And if you want cert client off, then do it. Post yes. Handshake. This seems totally fine. We okay. Do it. It's simpler. Okay. Okay. Does anybody uh, object to banning 
certificate based client auth for PSK in the handshake. Eric is making his way. Um, so I guess one question that, on how this interacts is one of the problems with session tickets today is that you're, you have, um, is that anyone who has a session ticket decryption key can emulate yep. any client. And one possible way to avoid that would be, or one possible way that servers could deal with this today is that if they, is to always force clients to re to at least do the client side of the re-auth. This makes that harder to do without going, going it, it to- Yes, this prohibits that. Post handshake off. Yes, this prohibits that. So you would have to reject that. resumption or do post handshake client off. So it'd be a little sad to, to, to lose one of the mitigators for that, even though I have no idea if no anyone's actually using that mitigator. It's not so useful. So, so, um, so you can actually do like post handshake client out without any uh, impact on round trip latency as well because of the 0 0.5 RTT data instead of you send like certificate requests. And so That's basically you could do the same thing without any uh, latency cost is just like it'll the state machine just is different and it's simpler. Uh, this is DKG also um, in this situation where your adversary has the session key decryption, uh, you got a whole bunch of other problems. So <laughs> like I'm he's impersonating you. Yeah. For example, yeah. So I, I'm 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 not convinced that we should make the whole the rest of the stuff more complicated for that particular use case. Like you need to protect that session key uh, encryption key. Okay. okay, any other objections to banning certificate-based client off with PSK in the handshake? All right. Okay, next slide. Right, so this is an issue that Antoine and Karthik raised. Um, so right now we have two sort of somewhat overlapping mechanisms that both do some of the same things. Um, so the, um, with a zero entry finish, which proves um, partial liveness of the pre-shared key via the ticket age extension, um, and also shows an integrity check for the information of the client hello. Um, so for instance, um, so as I was saying, as I said earlier, at the point where you process the client hello, you don't actually know any of the information is valid, but you can assume it's gonna be valid because when you process the finished, then you know it's gonna be okay. Um, the, um, uh, so, um, so, and then we have this resumption context which um, ties the context from the initial handshake, which established the PSK to future handshakes, which is what allows us, for instance, to be able to do signatures from the server on those subsequent handshakes. Um, so um, Karthik and Antoine and Cedric and a bunch of other people um, pointed out that these are kind of duplicative mechanisms and it's possible to merge them. Um, so um, the, um, um, it, they put another couple of problems too. Um, the zero um, resumption context, the out-of-band PSK, stops us from making the same kind of guarantees about uniqueness that we otherwise would make for the production PSKs. Um, from an implementation perspective, it's kind of a hassle to read the zero entry finished because basically um, at the point where you process the client hello, you actually had like all the information you needed to make decisions and all, this, and all the finish is doing is, is validating those. Um, so it's another read off, the, off the, it's another read through the state machine. Um, and um, also always adding the PSK context to the hash is kind of a clunky and a pain in the ass. And it's a pain, it's a pain to specify and it's, it's kind of a pain to implement unless you have a, if, if you have a very specific kind of implementation, which basically has like a one thing to pull out the, hand, the transcript, then it's okay because you keep it in a state variable, but like otherwise it's kind of a pain in the ass. Um, so, um, Next slide. So there were um, uh, Antoine and Karthik and, and I talked and we bounced around um, a bunch of options about what we could do here. Um, so, um, so, right. Um, so one option here is to remove the zero trip finish message um, and but basically take, throw away the resumption context field that you carry from the previous extension and instead just compute an HMAC of the client hello with the PSK and stuff that back in the resumption context field in the, in the hash transcript as if it had been sent on the wire, but it actually wasn't. Um, and um, this has, uh, um, uh, so um, this, so this, this removes the state machine element of reading the, the, the zero trip, the zero on trip, the, the finished in zero on trip or regular. Um, and you do this all the time, by the way, with P, anytime you're doing PSK. Um, and, um, but it has, it has the negative consequence that 
you don't actually, that the integrity check you get over the client hello comes when you try to read the first application data packet because the AAD fails, as opposed to having an explicit check in the handshake, which is what you pre, so previously you could like, you could, you could pretend that like AES GCM was completely busted and you would still have handshake guarantees and this removes those handshake guarantees of correctness. Um, the, um, uh, though potentially at some, potentially when you read this, the, the, when you, when you read the client's second finish message, then it transitively authorizes all this garbage. Um, so, um, the second option, which, um, Karthik suggested was to always send the finished right after the client hello. Um, even when you're not doing zero on trip, um, that's not acceptable. Um, and that's why it struck out because basically that means that anytime you're doing resumption, you're assuming that the server's a 1.3 only server or one three capable server. And it means making mixed data centers is very, very difficult. And so we had to sacrifice that to get streaming for zero on trip, but it's not acceptable sacrifice in my opinion to get, um, to merely have feature parity with TLS 1.2. So I struck that out because I don't think it's an option. Um, the, um, um, a third option, which is gross, but, um, but attempts to splice between these two is to basically have a special extension that you stuff at the end of the client hello that contains what would have been in the finished message, but it's just contained in the client hello's me message boundary, right? And so, um, and so what does this do? Um, this, basically folds this it still folds the resumption context in via the PSK into the transcript and it folds it automatically so you don't have to fold it in by hand every time you do it. Um and um um and it means that you don't have to go back to the well and the network to read the finished message because the whole thing is self-authenticating at the very moment you read it. Um so it is um it's a simplification of the implementation and, and, and the concept in a couple of ways. The um the the the, the Sort of painful part about it is that you have to be extremely careful about how you process the extensions to make sure that it can't be stripped out and to because you have to do a part and because you have to process the extensions linearly and you have to basically make sure it's the last one and, and and all and all those things i mean you do even if you don't get even if you don't if you don't fail if you fail to check it like you know it's not the worst thing in the world but it do, um but it does it does create some weird some weird behaviors so um if you fail to check it you're basically falling back on this um on it being folded back in the transcript on its own um and and the EAD not matching so um i'm not sure what i think about this um uh antoine wanted to raise it i think it is a valid point or important point to raise and it would be it would be a it would be it would simplify the state machine at the cost of, of, of making the making the record pro, the handshake record processing more complicated. Um, so I'm not sure it's a good trade off, but it's it's a trade off at least that I, I want to make sure we considered and explicitly accepted or rejected. And I think I, I know GKG's got opinions about this, and Antoine may want to clarify or amplify some of the points I've made here um, and 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 hit ones I missed because I'm partly proxying comments from Antoine and Karthik. Yes, so I, I want to make some uh, clarification points. So the, the, the first important point is that there is currently an attack in the, in the current draft, which is that uh, uh, when you have a client authentication signatures that are in an application PSK mode, which means that there is an empty resumption context, they can be forwarded. So this is an attack that we want to find one way of, of fixing. And um, this, 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 this should be clear. This is not resumption PSK. It's explicit no, PSK. It's only for application uh, external PSKs, not for resumption PSK. Re PSK is perfectly fine, but you still have forward forwardable client authentication signatures. It's exactly uh, the attack that is described in Cass Kramer's paper. It is still applicable to these external PSKs, and we think it's very problematic because we are trying to make a crypto proof, and in this case, this is blocking us. So we want to find one way around that, and, and here are some of the ways. And there is another thing that I want to point out is that there is um, um, a reason to be unsatisfied with the current drafts in terms of the zero TT handshake, which is that currently you send encrypted finished um, um, immediately after the client hello. And uh, we, we can actually prove that this is completely redundant mechanism because in order, if, in order to actually compute the finish then you need to have computed the, um, the key for encrypting the finish and uh, basically, if you if you trust your AAD encryption, then uh, effectively this can only come from a breakage of PSK. So um, th there is a, a complete redundancy in the current mechanism, and um, it is also redundant with the resumption context in the sense that uh, resumption context appears exactly to prevent sig uh, forwardable signature because it is some value that is derived from the actual PSK value and that goes into the log, and this is signed. And um, it is added explicitly, but if we had some messages inside the log that represented uh, this uh, um, 
um, value derived from PSKs and there would be no need to have resumption context or PSK context. And uh, this is what these uh, proposals are trying to achieve. So the first one um, um, is uh, um, uh, basically a, a way to uh, uh, have a very little change, but uh, uh, at least remove the zero TT finish at the cost of uh, moving some of the crypto burden to the uh, to the record. And the second one um, is uh, basically saying that uh, uh, we treat the, the zero TT finish as a ghost message. So it's something that goes into the log, but that is uh, not really computed. And uh, the way to actually implement that, I uh, think, is um, Eric's proposal is to uh, put it as a, a ghost extension, as something that is actually part of the message, but that you treat to be a separate message. So, Tom, before, before you sit down, um, you said there's an attack, but the the on um, the clients um, the client signature covers the covers that the server's finished. So, doesn't the attack require sharing the sharing the symmetric keys? Um, yes, but uh, things is falls into the. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to clarify what the situation is. is the, the Kramer's paper had an attack, even if the symmetric keys weren't shared. Correct. Yes, 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 yes. So yeah. it's not exactly the same, but uh, it is still uh, yeah. something that is uh, within the attacker model. Yes. Uh, this is DKG. So I'm actually still a little unclear on the motivation behind this. So I apologize if this is a confused question. Um, uh, I'm still trying to think it through, but. I want to just talk about the third bullet point here, yes. the proposal here. Um, the finished extension tends to be calculated over the client hello. Yes, it's, next slide. So yes, you're using extraordinarily gross. You have a client hello prefix, which is the beginning of the client hello, and then you compute the finished extension, you stuff it in the end of the client hello. Right, so. As noted, gross. Okay. So both. Um, I believe the attack is due to like um, the 0.5 RTT data, right? The presence of 0.5 RTT data, that's why the attack is present. And also to another point, it, it probably isn't redundant to like send finished message in the, um, in the, uh, from the client as well, because uh, the server can also negotiate like DH zero RTT or like now in the new spec, basically you can like re-auth the server and stuff. So there's still a few more messages which uh, the server can feed in, which are useful for clients to authenticate. But uh, I guess the attack is like, if you're doing client PSK auth with zero RTT or, or any type of client PSK auth and you're using 0.5 RTT data, then uh, then it is potentially attackable. Yeah. But uh, yeah, but not the, res not the resumption version, just the, just for that, but about the external PSKs, right? So Martin Thompson, more questions for clarification. How do you decide on the PRF hash in this context? Assuming that you're doing just straight up PSK with no zero RTT, you haven't negotiated you, you, you this. Would stuff. Need, you would need to negotiate it first. That, that's true. I mean, all the cryptographic computations are done after you do the negotiation. But this, I'm, I'm thinking about the one where you. Ah, yes, 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 yes. I see, I see your point. Your point. Yes, you'd have to. You, um, you, your you, point you is you have, to hash, you have to hash a part of the client hello. Yeah. So I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it's like repulsive, right? I mean, you have to like, you have yeah. to either, you have to, you have to, I mean, I'm trying to think how you implement this, but I think what you, I think what you do is you implement the finished part, in NSS at least, you implement the finished processor, and what the finished processor would do, you make, we basically make a, figure out the section of the message that corresponded to the prefix and put a, a box around that and then um, and then, and then you do the negotiation, and you go, and so it, it would, it would, you split those into two pieces: the pre and the post thing. It would write, the, write down the boundaries of those, or write copies, or whatever. And then you'd, and then after you do the negotiation, you have to go back and look at the extension. I mean, uh, it's, it's gross. Well, I imagine you could also just, if you were able to include one, um, one entry for every hash that you had present. Actually, actually I, take, I take it back. Actually, you don't, need, you don't need that because, um, the, uh, uh, because you know, um, the, uh. So actually, so, so now that I think about this, this actually creates a problem um, because if you're not doing zero on trip, then yes. th 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 yeah. So I, that's your point: is you have to you know, finish for each each PSK you offer, right? For every for every uh, PRF hash right function that you have available to you, you need to do that, and you need to then basically I, the only way that I can see no, it's actually it's actually worse than every PRF hash. It's every fin it's every credential key you're handed. Oh, and every key, yeah. Even if you have two keys, with exactly the same parameters. This runs into a problem, right? So, so it's a combinatorial explosion at that um, point. 
so so and 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 and, and the but the but the source of the problem there is the source of the problem is divorcing is is doing this in every mode, not just in, not just in zero trip mode, because zero trip mode you've already committed to one of the keys, so it's perfectly fine. The source of this problem is trying to handle non zero trip mode. Yes, in zero RTT, you're already committed to keys and yes. I, so that I that seems like that seems like a pretty fatal argument for this design. Um, um, yeah. Kenny Patterson, I'm still in the information gathering stage here. Um, I hope that's okay. No. <laughs> 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 um, if I understood correctly from what Antoine said, he, he said if we do nothing, which was one of the options, there's an attack. So I, th is I think that, is that correct? That, which so, means that do nothing is not right. Really, so I think so I think the, really right. So the, so the right. So the, there's a, there's a there's a not do nothing version, as I understand it, that merely involves specifying um, properly specifying the p um, that merely involves n replacing the zero in the um, in the resumption context for application defined PS case. That doesn't change anything else. Is that correct, Antoine? So you're right. do nothing is not an answer, but the but the not do nothing then the, the, that fix is very straightforward. And I forgot to mention yes. that. So we all agree that all of these proposals are quite gross, but uh, the, the the one that is least painful and closest to the current graph consists of finding a way uh, when you have an application provided PSK to also generate some associated uh, resumption contacts or PSK contacts that would use exactly as in the same manner as for resumption case. So both, I think we should add one more proposal to mix, maybe, like, why not? <laughs> so uh, why not disallow uh, 0.5 RTT data if you're doing client auth? And that seems to be like a simple solution to this problem as well. I, I'm not sure, I'm not sure, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but I'm not sure 0.5 RTT is the source of the problem. I, I think it is. Like, basically, as long as the client finish gets in first, as long as the client uh, actually can get its finished message after the early data, it can then authenticate the whole transcript uh, chain. The, uh, the data, the problem comes in like when you have application data, which is sent without actually authenticating the whole client hello. Essentially, like the negotiated parameters are not authenticated yet. So um, if you don't allow 0.5 RTT data, then you don't have this problem uh, with client auth. If the, if the server is doing client auth, it basically rejects, like, no, no I won't. It's not completely clear. I think. Um... I would like to say this would be enough, but I cannot guarantee it uh, because the analysis co does not cover uh, post uh, post on shake and. Uh, right. Yeah, could could we like uh, could we think about this problem as well? Like, uh, if it if it's potential as a potential solution, and so so, so yeah. I guess I guess so. Let, maybe let's try to do this. Um, we have two non-disruptive solutions that solve the security problem, and leave the and leave the arguable aesthetic problems, um, and then we have. Two other solutions, two other approaches, which are more disruptive changes um, that people may or may not like. So I guess the question is: Is there any? So the question is: Is there any? And so the answer to the question: so We can certainly think about exactly which arrangement of like whether making new PSK or banning zero point five zero T off and client instead of verify, um, neither of which would be disastrous. Um, um, would we want to do? So I think the question is: Is there any appetite for doing one, the two, either of the two more aggressive things um, listed on the previous slide? Um, I guess, for the record, I think that this, I, I now think that the second one is is that the second one, the third one after the strikeout is fatally flawed. So I don't know. How to, um, I mean, maybe maybe you'd maybe you'd you know that yeah you it, you would this third one you'd have to write zero RTT in place of PSK here, and then all you're getting is not the security benefit but the implementation benefit of not having to read forward to the finish. That doesn't seem like a big enough change. Uh, so both, uh, I think Martin had an interesting point. We haven't really analyzed like what's the combinatorial explosion of like what is the HMAC algorithm we'll use. Yeah, stuff like that I, I think this is. I think this is basically. I think basically, unless you're doing ZRTT, this is going to be implementable. And if you're doing ZRTT, then then we're just we're just trading off one kind of employee take message for another. Right. So I would just like to like uh, maybe the, if the cryptographers can also like analyze like uh, essentially the. Uh, the value of the 0 0.5 RTT data as well. That would be awesome. Thanks. But I mean, I, I consider the, this fatal flaw as something that is not really um, uh, completely tied to the solution that is proposed here, because in a sense, you have the problem um, in the key schedules that uh, if you want to start uh, computing uh, early secret and uh, if, if you have a different right. uh, PRF associated to different PSKs, then you do have the problem already. Well, I'm, I'm not concerned. Right, I'm not concerned. So, I mean, the, the right, but the issue here, the issue with this design in PSK is not how many things you have to compute; it's how many things you have to stuff in the message. Right? Is yes. if I have I have PSK A and B, which one goes in this extension? Right? 
So I, it's obvious I'm doing zero on trip because basically that data is ignored when I'm not doing zero on trip. But the question is, what are the what what are the semantics of I offered you? What are the semantics of I offered you PSK A and B, and I sent you a finish for only A, and then that and that's that doesn't work. So I, I think this is like basically, I think basically unless people like the first one, I think basically we're into we're, we're into one of the two changes, the, the two minimal changes you guys proposed. This might be something that needs a little list discussion or a little off yeah, a little offline we, discussion. I think we probably I, I think we probably need to have discussion on the list or some more background. I don't think we'll get to consensus okay. here. Okay. Next slide. Uh, next slide. Sorry. Okay. So this is hopefully pretty fast. Um, there's a bunch of discussion about having multiple concurrent. The, the spec implicitly implies you know, allows you to have as many tickets outstanding that apply to the same keying material as you want. Um, and this is useful for delinkage and stuff like that. Um, so the, tick, the spec gives you no guidance whatsoever on how to use them. There's some implication that maybe you should use the most recent ones first, but it doesn't tell you if it's likely that they're all going to work. Um, so um, I had a PR here that involved having an indicator that basically said, Somehow this ticket supersedes other tickets, and you could, you could describe how, exactly how you implemented that. Um, the version I had was tickets had generation numbers, and everything in the same generation is valued at the same time. Um, the, the the typical reasons you think about doing this would be if you did like if you did post handshake client off or some other state change, and you wanted to embed that in the ticket, that it would be nice to be able to say basically we tell the client if you like you know all. If if you want to get the maximum benefit from resumption, you need to use a new, this ticket, not this old ticket. And like, I, 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 and I guess I don't know. What, I mean, I guess the client would then be faced with if you wanted to do two resumptions of using the same ticket or getting minim, letting, getting less benefit. So you could do nothing. We could do nothing here, but I want to resolve this PR because it's like involve, involves the spec. So I generally think this is an improvement, but I'm not going to like go to the map for it. Yeah, Martin Thompson. I, I really don't like the generation thing, but. Um, I think that's because I, I'm not really clear what properties we're looking to actually get out of this. So the, pro the property I'm looking to get out of this is is to identify a set of tickets which are concurrently valid. And yeah. so, so the other op other major option would be to send all the tickets, all, all those concurrently valid tickets to the same ticket message by putting a by putting a list in there. That was uh, my that was that was my proposal. That would be so. Why did I not do that? It just seemed like slightly less elegant. But I. Part of, part of the problem here is we, we don't actually know what the client can expect is bound into a particular ticket. It's all, all kind of mysterious. Yes, that's right. And, so all you're basically all, saying all is that, use this, don't use this is the kind of instruction you're giving. Yeah, and so, I mean, there's a number of ways you can you, you can do this. Um, you could have a flag in the t in your session ticket saying all previous tickets yes. are dead. That's the basically that, them. That's effectively what you're doing with yep. generation. Yep. I don't know why you need to maintain a counter. I don't quite see how that's of any value, but fine, whatever. Um, I'd prefer to just dump a whole bunch of tickets on, on people and let them sort it out and suggest use the last one. Is any fix, Is anything needed here at all? So, so the reason that's that- That's my suggestion. I think okay. we might end up there. So this is DKG. The reason that we want to have multiple click tickets available on the client is because uh, you don't want, and any ticket that you use will be linkable if you use that same ticket twice. Correct. Correct. So, I think that's a great. So, yeah. so, so the client needs to know that there are multiple tickets available to it. If at some point the server state is going to change so that a given ticket is going to be treated differently um, for the same session, so something has advanced on the server side, uh, some knowledge has advanced, the server does need to be able to indicate to the client that, hey, if you use any of those tickets that you had before, they're not going to be as useful. They're not going to perform the same thing that you expected them to perform. And currently, the client has no way of knowing that, right? Currently, the client's yeah. like, oh, I've got this list of tickets. I guess I'll just keep reusing them. Yeah. Right? So, so uh, I think, so I think we all agree about th those points. The so, question so, is how so much. That's, so that's why we need multiple multiple tickets concurrently, and why we need to sometimes to be able to distinguish between sets of tickets. Yeah. So I, I think having so, a simple so flag would be the, sim the simple. For that, the trouble yeah. with the simple flag is that when you send it, you don't know when the client got it. So the client can get uh, a ticket with a given flag. OK, I got the ticket. It's got the flag. But you actually send a different ticket on a, on a separate <coughs> threaded series of resumptions uh, where the generation did not advance. Right? So the client might get these things out of order because they've got multiple resumptions going from a single session. Oh, well, OK. I wasn't even thinking we'd deal yeah, with that I, case. But yeah, I wasn't. We, we have a sequence number on these things, and they are strictly ordered. That gets complex. On on whose side? Uh, period. Strictly ordered. 
I mean, in, even in DTLS, all of these things have a have a sequence number. Within the same connection, yeah. I yeah. mean, I, I don't believe that there's any any value in doing cross -se session invalidation of tickets. I think that's. Uh, I, yeah, I was not attempting to solve. Maybe that's an important problem to solve, but it's not a problem as attempting to solve. Yeah. Um, by the way, um, now that since the tickets have extensions, we can add this later. So what, like, if we if we feel like we can't address this problem in a sensible way in a finite period of time, like this is actually something you could do at a subsequent point. Um, though maybe it would be good to do it now or not. Um, so, so, uh, so I was wondering, so when we had one ticket, basically we would uh, like, when there's a warning alert, a uh, sort fatal alert on like the connection, we would dump the tickets. Like, are we planning to dump all the tickets? If there was in the, uh, uh, we have to link all the tickets together and like dump all the tickets. I mean, I was assuming you'd have to link all the tickets. To the same. Either you do this or you don't, but if you do do this, then I think on the same connection you would. Yeah, could we like, basically is there a way to, I guess it's hard. Like, how do you indicate that the connection dropped because of a ticket being invalid versus like? It's like are it's they all required to be encrypted with the same key as well, or like different keys? And none yeah. of your none of your business how I make my tickets, you know? Right, right. <laughs> so, so David just asked, what is the state change that might be relevant? And an example of that is a midstream client auth. Yeah. Where what's stored in your session ticket? That's um, that that's my that's my base case. Yeah. Right. Where you don't know what's stored in there. Yeah. Um, so David, I'm trying to answer your question. Uh, you're, at, you're asking what's the state change that you're, that's relevant. So in, consider a midstream client authentication. Um, so you get, a set, you, get, you get session tickets um, before you do the client auth, and then there's a client auth and you get a new set of session tickets that encode in it something. You don't know what they encode, but for the server's perspective, when they get that session ticket back, they're going to be like, oh, yeah, this is, this is David Benjamin. Because they, they've encoded the client auth that they had previously done in those session tickets. So they want to let you know that the session tickets from before your client auth are distinct from the session tickets after your client auth. Which is especially so, valuable now that we've decided you can't client auth in PSK. So if you do that, um, you already have to deal with a case when, like, so, so, okay, so if you're doing midstream client auth, that means that, like, you don't know a period whether you're going to client auth until, like, I don't know, I fetch this URL. So let's say we're doing that. Um, so browsers maintain, well, maybe this is not a browser case, but, I'm, but like at least for a browser case, we maintain like multiple connections. Maybe I just happen to load balance like all of the requests that happen to hit the client auth URLs on one connection and all the other URLs on the other connection. So I already, and like maybe the, the unauthenticated connection happens to give me back a ticket. So like the whole system already depends on the fact that like we can handle sending the older ticket and then like we'll just do another midstream client auth request when you happen to hit the, the URL or whatever else. In fact, Chrome, um, mostly because I didn't want to write the test for it, will refuse to do any, ver ver like, so the old version of midstream client auth was the Renego hack, and Chrome refuses to do any kind of session resumption on Renego at all. We will never offer sessions, and we will never accept sessions. So like anything that anything bad that would go wrong here already goes wrong, and nobody seems to complain that I do this. So I'm guessing that no one's noticed. Um, I don't know, I'm like unclear on what we need this for. So Martin Thompson, perhaps you can remind me what the conclusion was regarding um, tickets and their use and the replacement policy that you talked about before. And we can just replay exactly the same conclusion in this context. I, I don't think we came to the conclusion as a problem. Well, you said you made some changes to the, the way that tickets were used and, and um, the semantics of a second new session ticket and that sort of stuff in your they, introduction. They, uh, the details, and I'm having trouble finding. Uh, I don't think that's what right. I was talking about. You weren't? No. Ah, okay. I, 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 I misspoke, yeah. perhaps. Um, so you spoke for quite a while about it, so I can't remember. <laughs> Maybe you misunderstood. I suppose uh, this question, I guess, for DKG as well. Like, as uh, so, the could you accomplish the same thing by like one ticket when the server keeps if so? Basically, the server really cares about privacy of users or non-linkage of users across like uh, across networks. So every time you connect back, it will like already in TLS one to spec. Although some implementations are buggy, uh, they you can update the ticket after ticket resumption as well with the ticket up with the new session ticket. So uh, and then the next time the client will go back, it'll like. So the my argument for that is like the semantics are simpler, like to deal. Oh, okay. Maybe Martin has other like at least it's like uh, there's one ticket active at once. But I'll let Martin like. So Martin Thompson, the reason that that doesn't work is that 
the very common practice at the moment, particularly for HTTP 1.1, is that you make one connection, you get a session ticket, and then you make 10 connections, bam. You, you, you actually need to be able to create multiple sessions from the one seed session um, in a lot of cases. Right, but that's only valid for like connections, like if you're actually doing MPTCP or something like that, like that's uh, like if you're doing raw TCP, you're on the same network and you're linkable any, like your, your sessions are linkable anyway by like other means. Yeah. No, not, not necessarily. And if we force make them linkable in this context, then we can't fix any of the other places where they might also be linkable. So I, I, would be, I would be really sad if we said only one ticket must be active at once. So your, your objective is to make not only like connections unlinkable across networks, but also connections made by single client unlinkable as well. Okay. Yes, definitely. Please. Okay. Make Andre Bob of Microsoft. So if we want to have both the unlinkability and the ability to supersede tickets, old tickets with new ones, then it seems that the most simple solution would be to send multiple tickets and then to say, you know, this bunch of tickets replaces everything you got before, you know. Yep, I'm, uh, I'd be fine with that. I, I decided for some aesthetic reason I like this better, but I'm happy to have that too. Sorry, I, I'm, I'm still not sure that we have a clear, clear semantics on that. So this bunch of tickets replaces everything every, you every, got before for the session to this peer for this connection i think for this connection though as a practical as a practical matter as a practical matter all as a practical matter the way the stacks behave is that they treat remote hosts as one unit no matter how many connections there are so the consequence would be that this would blow the consequence would be in a practical matter this would blow away all tickets to the, to the, to the remote peer so it's per peer not per connection that's how that's how implementations actually behave they're allowed to behave however they want but that's how they actually behave right and so and just because we're talking about session tickets, the the server doesn't actually know how many session tickets it's already issued to this peer. Um, yes. Not, not. I mean, it could. Most right? likely, most likely, right? Most likely, not. Yeah. Using session tickets is that you don't have to remember that. Yeah, most likely right? not. Yeah. So you farmed a bunch of tickets out. You don't know how many they are. Yeah. And you're now invalidating. Um, it, that wouldn't be the semantic, I don't think, in this case. It wouldn't necessarily be the semantic. Echo's talking about the way that we operate in a browser. If we get a ticket from a given origin, we will blow away all of the other tickets for that origin simply because we can't remember whether they came from this connection or from some other connection. We could fix that, but you know, why would we even bother? Um, but we may, we, we may fix that. The point being that you just, the semantic that we are trying to express is please don't remember any session tickets that I've previously given you on this connection. They're all invalid. Maybe they're not, but you know. Door's these ones are better. Please use these instead. And how do we choose to implement that? It might be a little bit more aggressive than, than that in terms of what, we, what state we forget, but that's just an implementation choice at that point. Hi. Uh, couldn't the server give the client a, uh, a key that it derives from some sort of random client identity so that the client could actually use the same ticket but make it look indistinguishable to an attacker? Say the client says I am foo, and the server HMAX foo. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, not because the the label for because either ever you give every client the same key, in which case you're back in the soup, or there's a label for that key, and that and that becomes the label. You have to do public key cryptography to make this work, as far as I can tell. I spent like a fuck ton of time trying to figure out how to do this, and I never was able to figure it out about public key. Of course, yes. Eric. Eric Nagren, I guess an, another use case for multiple current tickets ends up being to make um, key rotation mm -hmm. saner, which encourages people to do key rotation yeah. a little more frequently, but also makes some of the linkability stuff a little bit easier, although a lot of that you could still shove into the, the session ticket body and still get the linkage there. So it's, I think there's a trade-off there, because it would be nice to be able to support multiple being presented at the, in parallel um, and not fully replacing each other. So you could do key rotations faster, and if you have multiple clusters, have um, different keys per cluster. So in what semantic would you be thinking? I, I think that would be a case where, where accumulating and, send, and sending multiple identities in parallel is potentially helpful. But what would the server tell the client? With the server telling the client? Well, he would say, these are all, he would say, I sent you one an hour ago, and here's a new one, they're both concurrently valid? I mean, so that, that's the implied semantic now, basically, right? Or nobody knows what semantic is, but that, that's, that was one possible semantic, right? right? More, like, that would be, it would be nice to, like, while it might help linkability to, to drop that semantic, I think it would be good to keep that, I think 
dropping that semantic might have the consequence that people might. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean that that's that was why that, that was basically gener the reason I put generation in there was precisely to allow you to, to trickle them out over a long period of time and have them be concurrently valid, right? Um, but I guess maybe for us a question first: Do people think we should have the functionality of a way for the server to say these tickets are concurrently valid, and then if that's true, we can go bike shed exactly how we how how we design that that's that mechanic. Okay, so yeah, but let's let's bike shed on how we can have multiple concurrent tickets, and then also the the question of how we might invalidate other tickets. Okay, so those are those are the two things that we're sort of wrestling with, I think. So, uh, so I guess I guess the the question then is, do we do we want to continue discussing how we enhance the ticket functionality or not? Is that? I I think we're we're at the point now where where we know where the bike shed is, and we have ten cans of paint, and we just tell the people who are interested to go off and. Yeah. What, what, why, don't, why don't I sit down with the people who have expressed interest here and yeah. we'll try to work a proposal and then see if David hates it and if David's okay with it, then we'll propose it. Yeah. <laughs> Literally. Ilhan Baker. Yeah. Um, isn't the point of tickets usually that you want to avoid having to do server state? Yes. And uh, if you have these invalidation mechanisms, doesn't that guess as into No, you rolled your key, for instance. What? You rolled your key, for instance. Oh. Well, then they're going to die anyway. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I had this last minute thought um, that I know how David loves to like, you know, be able to send crap to the server and see what happens. Um, so there's no way. I just occurred to me, and we, we talked. We talked at some very early interim about like with DKG called Type B extensions, basically where these where the client would send something in a second flight and um, so I guess I wanted to suggest that maybe maybe it would be a useful a useful protection against a future proofing to add even an empty encrypted extensions message in the second flight, so the client has some way to some way to indicate stuff that is secret to the server. The ma main con for this is to not include the handshake transcript, so be careful what you actually put in there. But I, there's lots of things that you could put in there that would be meaningful that wouldn't be um, that, that, would, that would not require negotiation. Uh, Martin Thompson, I, I apologize. You sent me your slides, and I didn't get this fast. This ended up at the, This came at the end. You yeah, didn't get it. Um, the, for me, a big emphatic no. If we want to do this, uh, we can negotiate something with it with extensions and send new handshake messages if it if it comes to that. But I really don't see any use for it now. Um, I have no use for it now. It's purely feature proof mechanism. Yeah, let's not do that. Anybody think this is a good idea? Okay. I mean, also, Sabo was Benny Meyer last night about how nice it was to be able to put random shit into places. That's part of the motivation too. So, so if you don't, if you don't like it, I'm actually more, more, more less excited about it. Okay. Um, so quickly, um, we had we had this nice hackathon. We had seven implementations um, at, at the hackathon on Sunday. Here is the interop graph. Um, it's possible that lower right hand corner actually is fine now. Um, I don't know. Is there any news? Okay. So. Um, uh, Minton Boring, are okay. Oh, that's green. Okay, good. So that's green, and um, and so it's possible. Lower right hand corner. Um, Nick, do we? Uh, do you know if Bogo and TLS Trust can talk? Uh, Nick Harper, Bogo and TLS Trust can talk. If I use TLS Trust from Master, but I can't uh, from GitHub, but I can't talk to their server, so I'm working that out. Okay, so we're almost all green except for um, except for the except for Proto TLS, which I don't know what the problem is there. Um, so that's really good news. Um. The key here is um, the, the key, the key here. Uh, go back for a second. It can, it's just like what different features we tested. So um, uh, if, if you're not on here and you'd like to be on here, you know where to find us. And there's and uh, separately we have a list of servers you can test against. Um, two slides in. Um, here's my proposed timeline for how what things are going to take. Um, um, so I'm going to try to turn out draft 15 in probably two weeks, um, which I'll, all the changes we've agreed upon. If I if I if I really get the job done well, we'll also have the the the, the one change that we have to like bike shed on. Um, um, anyway, so you can look at this. So if you're like if you're someone who's doing analysis, you should be thinking about having a version, look at seeing a version towards the end of August that like has is everything frozen on the wire and you can be analyzing. So Martin Thompson, uh, why format frozen? Are we going to do the experiment 
in that time frame for I think we can yes record. and it can and it is that will not that, that won't that will not affect the any, any analytic question yeah it, it shouldn't change the analysis but we should yeah good point um, thank you make sure um, that happens okay um I guess let me get off so I think I get other people yeah. want to talk well let's see if we can have time for Keith uh Keith we could be a little as quick as you can I'll, I'll be brief. It's a very uncontroversial change, so should be no problem. All right, this is about adding one field to the key update message. Uh, as you probably all know, the key update handshake message is a message either side can initiate. Uh, and uh, we can go to the next slide. Essentially, it's an instruction to the other side that says, please ratchet your receive key forwards and delete the old key. And oh, by the way, if you haven't updated your send key to the same generation as the receive key that I'm now asking you to update to, do that too, and then you have to send me a key update in response. Those are the semantics of the key update message. This is the current key update message. Would you mind zooming out? Maybe so we can see the, the titles too. Yes. Thank you. This is the current key update message. And uh, what we're proposing is, uh, on the next slide, is this. We're proposing that endpoint should learn the current receive generation of the peer when it sends a key update message. And we have some proposed explanatory text. There it is, the receive generation is the generation of the receive keys in use by the sender of the key update message. Now, why do we want this? Oh, just to be clear, there's a lot we're not changing here. It's still just as asynchronous as before. There's no blocking. The endpoints already have to maintain these traffic key generations, so we're not asking anybody to keep track of anything. There's no obligation to do anything with this message on receipt. Uh, many endpoints maybe don't care. Let's keep going. So why do you care? The case you want to know this is if you're asking the other side to ratchet their key, if you care that they did it. That's when you care. If I'm asking you to please delete the current version of, your, of the received traffic key, I want to retire that. Uh, I might, if, if I care about knowing that that actually happened, that's why I want to know the received generation field in an incoming key update message. Otherwise, I can't know exactly when it takes place. I can send a key update message. I can get a key update message in reply. Uh, excuse me. I can get a key update message, but I don't know that that key update message was in reply to my own key update message. Maybe you just decided to increment your send keys uh, on your own initiative. That doesn't mean that you've received my key update message and have ratcheted your receive keys. So that's why we want this field. In some example use cases, uh, an embedded device might be very paranoid. It might want to make sure to rotate the keys and delete the old keys before it goes to sleep. Maybe when you're closing the TLS session, you want to be very paranoid. You want to make sure the traffic keys are dead before you close the session. Uh, you know, and if that doesn't work, what do you do in response? Well, maybe David goes to your house and kills you. I, I learned that's now a new higher level escalation. Maybe there is a higher level way for the application to tell the server, please kill all of my active sessions because somehow this particular, on this particular session, we weren't able to retire the keys. So I just want to log in and just kill everything on my, my user or some high level principle. There, there, there would have to be some sort of higher level mitigation. But the point here is that the TLS library will be able to signal uh, to, the, to the application or, or may be able to signal the application if uh, key rotation has occurred. Or certainly it can signal when key rotation has occurred. Uh, and finally, one application we're interested in, I'm sorry, it was the, the bottom on that previous slide. Uh, if you're interested in doing read-only auditing, like an IDS or a virus scanner, without giving full man-in-the-middle access to, this, to, to the auditor, then you want to be able to release keys to the auditor only after you know that they're not in use, that they've been superseded on both sides. Uh, but the only way to know they've been superseded again is to know that the other side has, has confirmed, yeah, I deleted your key. So uh, we'd like to add this field. Okay, I think we'll take discussion of this to the list. All right, well, we, we had discussion on the list, and it oh, okay. didn't go anywhere. That's why I'm here. Okay, and then is we can, uh, I guess, does anybody object to this change? Any discussion? I think my objection to this, and I may be misremembering, but is that it seems to collapse two different semantics into I'm now using the new key and I have actually deleted the old key. Um, and uh, right, it does both of those things. Well, in the current draft, on receiving a key update, it is mandatory to ratchet the receive key forwards. Right, so that's updating the key. But this also says, and delete the old key. No, well, it, the, the, the mandatory behavior is to ratchet the, the key forward. Now, you, it, once you've updated to a new receive key, there's no reason to retain the old receive key. But you know, I don't think it's, yeah, that, that, that's, that's the current language. You have to, there's, there's no reason to retain the receive key once you've ratcheted it forwards. There's no, I mean, I would agree that there's no good reason to retain the receive <laughs> key. But there may be a reason to retain this receive key when you're talking about interception 
proxies or whatever. Um, so if I send this and I say I've deleted it, but actually what I've done is I've forwarded it off to the... Okay, yeah, let, me, let me be clear. Proxy. You raise a good point. Let me be clear about the semantics. What's important is that the key no longer be operational for trusting incoming traffic. That's what I mean by ratcheting for the received key. So it's, it's not about deletion per se. The big, bold, blue text here says, delete the old key. You're right. That, that is a mistake. This is my gloss on the text. Let me, let me try to explain what I think the motivation is here, which is you're saying, I will no longer accept data with this key. Therefore, it is safe to give it to somebody who you might not trust for purposes of integrity, but you trust for purposes of confidentiality. Is, is, do I have that correct? That's correct. So, so the idea is you have, you have these two devices at either end of the connection, right? And um, and they want to leak the key to a third party, which is doing auditing, but they don't want that, that thing to be able to like, write, you know, tell your toaster to, to catch on fire. And so you say, well, the toaster says, look, I've stopped listening with this key, so it's safe to give it to somebody else, and maybe they learn like what the address of my toaster is, but they can't tell me to do anything. That's the, that's the, that's the desired outcome. Uh, Stephen Farrell, uh, yeah, ick, um, but it's, yeah, I don't really like this kind of thing, but um, that's as an individual participant. Uh, I think this was discussed in the mail, it look, looks like back in February and March for about five messages. So I, I'm not sure it would be correct to, uh, what I could say that this has been discussed on the list properly. Mm -hmm. um, you have near, is this, um, this uh, received generation field that you're adding is simply just a counter, isn't it? There's, does correct. It have it's a counter. Than, so why do we really need it? I mean, we have our, T, our TCP stream. So obviously the first one is number one, the second one is number two. Why do we have to have the number in there? I'm sorry, I don't understand so, the, the so question. Your, your, the, the, the concern is that you're actually saying things about the opposite stream, opposite flow of data. So key update says things about the changes in the keys that you are transmitting. So you, you send a key update and then you change the keys that you're using for the transmission of messages. This is actually talking about the corresponding stream and you need a way to align the two of them if you're gonna do something like this. You need to be able to say things about what point in the other stream this change corresponds to. Uh, yeah, but align them where? I mean this is the, this is the Again, if I send of, you a key update, the only way for me to know that that's happened is with this kind of information. Otherwise, I, I have no idea when you've actually ratcheted the key forwards. Because you may be doing your key update unilaterally without having seen his key update. Right. So I, th I think we're, we're out of time, unfortunately. Uh, so we'll have to take discussion to the list. Well, see what happens. Yeah, so well, uh, hopefully there'll be more this time. Anybody need a blue sheet? Need to sign a blue sheet? Everybody sign? <laughs>